Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 22nd uh, Council Meeting of the City of Port Colborne. Before we get into um, the National Anthem, I just want to introduce Saima Tufail, our Deputy Clerk, who's taking over for Charlotte while Charlotte's on her mat leave. And uh, Saima, welcome. And I'm sure I can speak on behalf of Council. I think you're going to have a great time here in the City of Port Colborne. Thank you. Uh, so if we could uh, call this meeting to order and have the National Anthem. And thank you to our McKay Choir. Niagara Region is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Hottawendorong and the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, including the Mississauga of the First Nation. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The city of Port Coburn stands with all Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands in which we live. Uh, Council, we have two proclamations this evening. If I can ask Councillors Beauregard and Demeray to move item 4.1, Year of the Garden, 2022, and item 4.2, World Autism Awareness Day, April 2nd, 2022. Any questions, Council? All in favor, please raise your hand. And that's unanimous. Thank you, Council. For the adoption of the agenda, if we can have Councillors Wells and Bodner uh, move that. Are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Again, unanimous. Disclosures of interest. I have two disclosures of interest. The Councillor Bodner on item 8.4 and Councillor Beauregard on item 8.8. .8. Any further disclosures of interest? Seeing none, thank you. We have two sets of minutes. If I can have Councillors Danch and Bruno move regular meeting of Council March the 8th, 2022, and the public meeting of March the 15th of 2022. Are there any questions on either of those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried unanimously. We have the following staff reports being brought forward. 8.1, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, 8.7, 8.8, and three correspondence items, 9.1, 9.3, If I could have Councillors uh, Kaleleth and Bagu move the remainder of the items not being lifted. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. There are no delegations this evening or presentations. And I'll get into my mayor's report. Starting yesterday, the province removed the requirement to wear a mask except on public transit, health care, long-term care, and congregate living settings. Based on a recommendation from our emergency control group, city staff will continue to wear masks in all situations until at least April the 4th. Please be respectful of anyone who chooses to continue to wear a mask, regardless of provincial guidelines. And if you still need to get your vaccination or your booster, 
The next Port Colborne vaccination clinic is scheduled for this Friday, March the 25th, from 9.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the Humberston Information Centre on Main Street. You, have, you may have noticed over the past week the yellow ribbons on the lamp posts in front of City Hall. We have hung these every year since 2009 when Corporal Tyler Crooks lost his life in Afghanistan. These yellow ribbons symbolize our remembrance not only of Tyler and his ultimate sacrifice while serving his country, but of all past veterans and current personnel serving our country. The current conflict in Europe is a stark reminder of the sacrifices made during times of war. I would ask everyone to bow their heads for a moment of silence as we remember. Thank you. The Municipal School Crossing Programs Committee of Niagara is encouraging residents to show their support and appreciation for their neighborhood crossing guards on Ontario School Crossing Guard Appreciation Day, tomorrow, Wednesday, March the 23rd. Help us recognize these individuals whose assistance helps young residents with their active and safe travel to and from their school. A reminder to join us this Thursday at Lockhate Park for our Top Hat Ceremony. We're back live and in person. We'll start at 8 a.m. with fair trade coffee and hot chocolate, followed by the ceremony at 8.30 a.m., where we welcome the first downbound ship of the season. This ends my mayor's report. I thank you, and we ask you to please stay safe. Any questions with regards to the mayor's report? Thank you, Council. At this time, we have the Regional Councillor's Report. We have Regional Councillor Barb Butters in attendance. Just bringing Barb in here. There we are. Welcome, Councillor. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Mr. Mayor, and all the, all the rest of Council as well. Um, glad to be here tonight with you all. I'm going to be uh, quick like a bunny. So today <laughs> is World Water Day. Uh, it's been held on the 22nd of March every year since 1993. It focuses on the importance of fresh water. A World Water Day celebrates water and raises awareness of the 2.2 billion people living without access to safe water. It is about taking action to tackle the global water crisis. And a core focus of World Water Day is to support the achievement of sustainable development goal number six, water and sanitation. Um, all by 2030. So uh, this year in 2022, the focus is on groundwater, an invisible resource with an impact visible everywhere. Groundwater is water found underground in aquifers, which are geological formations of rocks, sands and gravels that hold substantial quantities of water. Groundwater feeds springs, rivers, lakes and wetlands and seeps into oceans. Groundwater is recharged mainly from rain and snowfall infiltrating the ground. Groundwater can be extracted to the surface by pumps and wells, as we know very well in Ward 4. Life would not be possible without groundwater. Most arid areas of the world depend entirely on groundwater. Groundwater supplies a large proportion of the water we use for drinking, sanitation, food production, and industrial processes. It is also critically important to the healthy functioning of ecosystems such as wetlands and rivers. We must protect them from over exploitation, abstracting more water than is recharged by rain and snow, and the pollution that currently haunts them since it can lead to the depletion of this resource. Extra costs of processing it and sometimes even preventing its use, and we've seen that happen out in Wayne Fleet. Exploring, protecting, and sustainably using groundwater will be central to surviving and adapting to climate change and meeting the needs of a growing population. And a little, just a little bit of history. Um, the idea for this International Day goes back to 1992, the year in which the United Nations uh, Conference on Environment and Development in Rio, Rio de Janeiro took place. That same year, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution 
by which 22nd of March of each year was declared World Day for Water to be observed starting in 1993. So just a couple of quick facts here. Um, did you know almost all of the liquid fresh water in the world is groundwater? About 40% of all the water used for irrigation comes from aquifers. Asia and the Pacific region has the lowest per capita water availability in the world, with groundwater use in the region predicted to increase 30% by 2050. And in North America and Europe, nitrates and pesticides represent a big threat to groundwater quality. 20% uh, of the European Union groundwater bodies exceed EU standards on good water quality due to agricultural pollution. So what we have here in Port Coburn is one of those wonderful, highly vulnerable aquifers. And i um, really glad that Port Coburn acknowledges and recognizes the need to protect it and preserve it as well as the region. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Councillor Butters. Any Welcome. questions to the regional councillor? Councillor Danch. Thanks so much. Uh, just one quick one, Barb. I know the city street uh, sweepers have been out in Port Coburn, and I know we are a little bit early. But I, I'd like to get uh, Main Street put on the agenda there for, for more than maybe twice a year. Um, it's just, it, it's got to be the, the busiest street in Port Coburn, and it needs to be maintained. If you could look after that for me, I would say thank you very much. I will be happy to do so, Councillor Danch. Great. Thank you, guys. Any further questions? Seeing none, Barb, again, thanks. Thank you. See you Thursday. We'll see you then. Bye. Staff remarks. Uh, I'm going to start with our CAO, Scott Louie. Um, thank you. Through your worship to Council, I have been in the habit for the past, I guess, two years of sending a COVID update report to the last council meeting of every month, which I guess would be today. But last time I sent one, I said that we're going to stop those reports unless there was something of substance to report. Um, and of course, some things happen after the deadline for report writing. But one of the things that I would like to make sure that all council is aware of and the public as well is that we do have plans to return to in-person council meetings in the city council chambers. Um, we're going to use uh, physical distance to make sure that everyone's safe. We're going to follow public health guidelines and advice. We will be open to the public again. We do encourage the public, if they can, to continue to watch on YouTube and participate in that way. But of course, the council chambers is always open. Our plan is to commence this, barring any changes in the current conditions in the area, in the Niagara region. April 26th, which is one month from this meeting, the second meeting of April. I thank Council for their patience while we were in this unique format of delivering our Council meetings and the public. I know it's been different than what we're used to for so many years. Um, I think we've had some successes with the Zoom technology and, and bringing in delegates remotely, but we're all anxious to get back to normal. And uh, thirdly, just staff, because it was uh, a lot of work for the clerk's department, IT department, we stream our contractor who broadcasts our meetings. But we're finally at the point where we can start to gradually reopen. And one of the things we want to reopen first is, for, for reasons of accountability and openness and transparency, our council meetings. So look for that on April 26th, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Thank you, Mr. CIO. Madam Clerk, anything from the clerk's office? None at this time, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, online we have uh, Mr. Kalamoto. I'll let you up first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I usually don't talk too, too much, but I think uh, there's a lot going on in public works. So if uh, I'm going to take a few moments to just provide some updates that uh, the council and the public uh, might want and might want to be aware of. Uh, the first one is uh, the salt dome damage. We had some damage through a windstorm uh, a while back. Just wanted to report that all of the um, material has been fabricated and all the prep work has now been completed on the dome. There was uh, this, the contractor did come to try and put it on, but there was a miscalculation on their part about the size uh, that is needed for that fabrication. It's just a little bit larger than it actually should be. So they have taken it back. They're gonna cut it down to the appropriate size and hopefully we'll have that salt dome patched up 
uh, by the end of the week. The second one, as Councillor Danch mentioned, there is a sweet street sweeping going on, say that five times fast. We are uh, starting uh, at the downtown core again to try to get everything cleaned up. So when the uh, additional uh, works with regard to patios comes uh, in into place, they have a nice uh, clean area to put those uh, for the businesses. Once we finish the downtown core, we're going to then be working on the primary roads. And then uh, in the next month or two, we'll start working on the primary roads. So just wanted to give uh, anybody who is, uh, is watching and listening about a pro approximate time frame about street sweeping. And as Councillor Danch mentioned, it is early. We are taking a chance to make sure that uh, there is no more snow that we have to put on sand and salt, but uh, we're gonna cross our fingers and get the streets cleaned up as early as we can. The third thing is that uh, we're very happy in, uh, in the city to note that we have a bids and tender software now. So that is up on our website. Anybody who has signed up for the city website has already received a push notification that this new software is the way to, um, to bid on uh, any projects that, is gonna, that are gonna be going on, on the, in the city. So if anybody wants to know any of the projects that we have out, please take a look at, uh, at our website and that will go to bids and tenders. It makes it a lot easier for any contractor or consultant to bid on any of these projects. So it's currently on our website. And like I said, there was a push notification to anybody who, who signed up. So that is, uh, is known. The uh, fourth one is just an update uh, from some questions that I received on Lions Field. There's a little bit of works going on right now. We're getting it ready for actually to be able to play softball and, and maybe even a little bit of hardball. The staff are currently putting on uh, outside uh, outfield fencing, sorry, I should say outfield fencing. It's gonna be a 12 foot uh, fencing. It's not a green monster, but some 12 foot fencing, chain link fencing up from left field to center. And then from center to right field, there's some eight foot fencing going in. Uh, those, that fencing, also has some space and gates, I guess you can call them, that can open up for carnival operations when the carnival's uh, there. This work is in conjunction with the Lions Club, so it's a partnership with the Lions Club that has contributed some money towards this project. And uh, as everybody knows, there are three poles located within the outfield of uh, this current field. So we're actually gonna be moving those back so that the entire field can be utilized and played and therefore softball and some hardball can be played there too. So right now the field is very soft. So there is a little bit of work being done, but not too, too much. However, once the ground does uh, dry up, we're hoping to complete those particular projects by the end of May. There are some additional works uh, coming online that we're gonna be applying for, but I'll leave that for another day. The uh, fifth one that I wanted to give an update on um, through council is uh, the Valley Health, Valley Health and Wellness Center uh, that was brought up, that roof in particular, that was brought up uh, earlier in, uh, in council. So the, we did want, go out and take a look and we have actually finished fabricating uh, the drip tray, I guess you can say it, for uh, the upstairs weight room. So we're going to be uh, putting that in. All the measurements have been done. We're currently working with the YMCA to see when the best time is or how we can put that in with minimal disruption to users of the facility. So that, because it's about uh, three days worth of work. Uh, so that's going, that is uh, taking place right now. We just have to exercise caution because for example, in uh, the large room where the gym is, there's not much that can be done with regard to uh, a, a medium fix or a band-aid solution. Just because of where the sprinklers are, they would, they would have to be completely relocated and supported again, and there would be a large cost for an interim solution. Um, however, there haven't been any major leaks in the past month, um, but what you'll hear about in uh, either the uh, Director of Finance's um, end of year uh, presentation that he's going to be doing uh, next council meeting. We're still, uh, as noted to council before, still noting to hope, hope to have 
council approved some money for the permanent uh, fix on the roof uh, with respect to that. So I know that was, uh, that was a lot of things and a little bit of time, but did want to give that, uh, those progress uh, reports. Uh, and thank you if, there's, if there are any questions. Great, thanks Mr. Kalamoto. Uh, Council Bruno. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the excellent report. Um, just with regard to your last item on roof at the Dale, um, I'm always concerned about the delay between uh, bid and implementation. So um, given Mr. Bowles coming back, if the news is good that there's money there, then you have to start enacting your processes. And I'm concerned about um, lead time and I'm wondering if, with respect to a roof like that, is uh, that particular sector of the construction business uh, as busy as everyone else is? And so what do you, I don't know if you can cast any um, light on what, even if you were to start tomorrow morning, is, is that a pretty um, uh, packed schedule for your suppliers out there right now? Mr. Kalamoto? Uh, thank you through the through the chair uh, to the council. That is an excellent question. Uh, as we all know, uh, even as recently as uh, yesterday with the CP strike, there are some issues um, with getting materials in and the supply chain. So what we do plan to do to expedite it is we will be ready to hit the trigger and as I noted, the bids and tenders to put it on bids and tenders the day after council approves it, if council approves it. Um, the, the director's report. The other thing that we're, we would like to do is do a design build. So that is basically both the design and the building in one um, tender. And it only go, it is kind of in, in two sections. So if the designer comes in, they submit that uh, to staff at the city, and then it is just a, basically an approval um, from the city and they can seamlessly go into uh, the construction of it. So it's kind of like uh, killing two birds with one stone, I guess. So that's another way to expedite it. So we'll be ready as soon as uh, council gives us the go ahead and with the efficiency of bids and tenders and with the design build process, we're hoping that we would still be able to have that done before the next winter comes. Thank you, Mr. Calamoto. Council Bruno. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm a big fan of design build, particularly if they are, you know, relatively straightforward projects. I'm just wondering, um, I'm assuming though that you still look at um, a rigorous look at their qualifications. I just didn't know whether design build, you're right, could expedite things potentially, but would it attract, um, I guess, the quality firms? I mean, we've seen what happened with our roof and, you know, that's water under the bridge, but, you know, whether that company being a subcontractor of the general or whether it was let separately, I think there was some discussion of that, is just making sure that the best, brightest and, uh, and great contractors do this so we get a quality job. I mean, obviously dollars and cents are always a consideration, but are you confident that uh, design build these days can still attract um, the qualified contractors you would want to be doing something of this magnitude. Thank you. Mr. Calamoto. Uh, through the chair to the councillor and, and all of council, uh, again, uh, depending on uh, what's out there is, is what we get, but this is this type of work uh, for design build uh, does happen uh, in a regular basis. Okay. Uh, because again, uh, as noted through the Valley Health and Wellness Center, but other uh, buildings too, sometimes, well, often the roof is uh, a particular singular issue. So there are companies that uh, have those expertise with, re with regard to design build for uh, commercial uh, facilities uh, for that expertise. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Councilor Bruno. Councilor Baggett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kyle Moldu. Uh, my only concern is we're asking for design and build contractors, but if we actually had a professional engineer look at it to see what our need is, like what I'm a little skeptical about, like we've spent tens of thousands of dollars so far and 
my philosophy almost is I don't care if you have to get the guy from Toronto or Montreal. Let's get the guy that knows the most about roofs to see what we actually need. Like I hate to have somebody come in that's, that I would consider subpar as they, they can fix it and it, it, it goes on and then uh, a year later it leaks. And uh, again, like this problem's been going on for so many years before you were here, before I was on council. Now, I would love to see this fixed before this end of term of council, but uh, that's that's my only uh, concern is the expertise and see what we actually need of 100%. Mr. Calamoto? Yes, absolutely. That's a very good point. Uh, sorry, three of uh, you, Mr. Chair, to the council. That is uh, actually a very good point. I do feel even better now that we have the bids and tender software with regard to our procurement because that actually casts a much wider net because there are a, a lot more consultants and contractors on bids and tenders and again they may be throughout the province but we would get the best ones so depending on we would create the actual bid but when we put it out onto our bids and tender software it casts such a, a, a much wider so it's not just the locals it could be as the councillor mentioned, somebody from from Montreal, but we would get probably um, because it's because it is a larger net. We should be able to get much much more highly qualified uh, consultants and contractors. And obviously, there would would have to be uh, the consultant first with the engineer uh, engineering staff to take a look at exactly what uh, the fix should be. Then that fix would be submitted uh, to staff and and, it's, and the city to take a look at. And then that uh, consultant would work with the contractor to, to get that completed. So uh, taking a look at the timeline, uh, depending on um, the approval uh, next month, the time frame would still be before the end of the winter. Great, thank you. You all set, Councillor? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Good, thank you. Councillor Clayoff. Through you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Kalamutu, I just had a question. I wondered. This company, I wasn't on council when the when the center was built, but I wondered there must have been other buildings that were done, other roofing roof projects that were done by this particular company. Has there been the opportunity to speak with anyone who used the same company just to find out if they had issues and how they resolved them, who resolved them for them? I, I guess I just sometimes you know you can cast a big net out there, but if you can find somebody who who actually had the same type of problem with the same type of roof, we might be able to get to the bottom of it all quicker. Mr. Calamora? Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, to the Council, that's an excellent suggestion. I can take a look to see uh, who it was, if they're still in business, and if uh, what other um, facilities that they have done. I have uh, previous experience in facilities just like this and, and with roof leaks um, and with uh, with other, other um, asset issues with facilities so I do have uh, some connections that I can reach out to also and see if they uh, also have had a similar issue it might have been done by a different company but mm -hmm. again sometimes the solutions we could uh, cut and copy just a thought thank you thank you counselor and that company no longer is in operation they've gone bankrupt mm -hmm. so I, I realize that they yeah. weren't in operation mr. mayor I just thought that if the buildings are still standing, if we could contact somebody and ask them, you know, if you, if you could find, figure out if they had any issues and then go from there, kind of how they repaired them. Because if the company's not fixed ours, I'm sure they haven't fixed a few others that have been around. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. No, no. Uh, and I was going to suggest that uh, Mr. Kalamoto contact our architect because it was through the architect that that roofer was pre-qualified. So our general contractor had no input on who the roofer would be. It was the architectural firm. So Chris, you can we can get you that information and you can talk to the architecture firm. So I'm sure they'll give you a number of organizations that have you had to use that uh, company when they were in business. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, seeing one more. Uh, so you're all set, Chris? Perfect. Uh, Mr. Bowles, you're up. Great. Uh, thank you. Through yourself to uh, Council. Uh, one, just an apology that the year-end surplus report uh, was delayed to the next Council meeting. 
Uh, as council's aware, we did a number of account changes and we thank council for their patience as we did those, but we also needed to give the auditors a little more time to work through their working papers to update for all the account changes and we'll have it at the next, uh, we'll have it at the next council meeting for you. Another item that uh, came up recently, I just want to bring it to council's attention if you, if, if it didn't cross your desk or to the public's is that some people had noticed that there's a bit of a sand uh, mound that's starting to build up towards the end of the uh, the uh, the entrance for where the boats actually come in, our, our boat ramp. Um, we did uh, have the guys, uh, the team go out today. We took one of the work boats out and we did find that uh, we have five feet at current water levels and the current water level is down about two feet from kind of a normal uh, season. So we did have five feet coming straight in um, and then it, it does go down to four and it comes back up to, to five to be able to get the boats around. It's not as high as a, the watermark is what it used to be, uh, but it is something that it will cause us to accelerate our um, work on the dredging uh, projects that we talked about during the capital budget. Uh, the team has been having conversations at the ministry levels to uh, look at applications to be able to move forward on the dredging projects faster. Because as you move towards the, uh, the break wall, uh, the sand definitely gets a lot closer to the water level and it gets a lot shallower. When the uh, water and the, and the when this wind is kind of blowing in the right direction, you can see the sand along on the inside of the marina along the break wall. Um, and it is something that we're, we're monitoring closely, but we are, we're, we just want to let council to know that we're on it and uh, we'll be back to council a lot sooner than I think you might have anticipated talking about dredging. Great. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. I wouldn't apologize about bringing the year-end report forward because I think you're months ahead of what we normally get it at. So yeah, even though you're delayed because of uh, the circumstances uh, with the way we're reporting, uh, you're, you're still months ahead. So we appreciate that. Uh, questions to that? Uh, seeing none. Any further comments from staff? Okay. Not seeing any. Councillor's remarks. Councillor Wells, you're up. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, nothing for me. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bodner. Nothing here. Thank you. Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have uh, one item that I'd like to bring forward. Um, I'd just like to draw attention to uh, some work I'm doing with the Age Friendly Niagara. It, uh, it's a regional committee that is struck to uh, see to the needs of predominantly seniors, but for, for all, uh, all ages. Um, there has been the establishment of something called the Older Adult Info Link. Um, and what that is is a, a 211 service that um, outlines all services available for uh, older adults. I'm going to actually share the poster with council members just so that you, you would have the information in case anybody asked you. But uh, the Seniors Committee will be, will be uh, at the Port Colbert Market on in, in the month of June, uh, every Friday morning, and we'll be sharing this information with local seniors as well. But I wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Can you get that information to uh, Michelle and Zinga so they can get it out on our social media too? I absolutely will. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor Clayloff. I'm good, Mr. Mayor. I had my questions answered. Great. Thank you. Councillor Baggy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Dr. Cow moved to took two of mine, which is fine. I got no problem with that. Um, I did talk to, uh, well, I emailed the director regarding the potholes at H.H. Snow Park, the roadway that goes parallel to the shore between the lodge ramp and the marina. And uh, I was under the impression we had our, we had our hot box already, but uh, the director uh, informed me it was on bid. So, uh, but they are going to fix up some of those holes. Uh, shortly for the uh, cars and basically it was a little bit of a problem because cars they're actually waiting and going around the pothole so it was obstructing some traffic at that so uh, I uh, have faith in the director to take care of it. Uh, my other I guess it would, a, it would be a question is uh, since we are opening up City Halls in a big way I guess um, are all the committees and the advisory committees of council be going to be opening up also, Mr. Uh, I guess that goes to the CAO or the 
the uh, Madam Clerk. Sure. Through your worship to, yeah. Yep, through your worship to Councillor Bagu. Uh, we are in the midst of getting our committees back into in-person meetings. Um, most committees didn't meet at all prior uh, during the pandemic. Very, very few have started to recently meet using uh, online meeting technology like Microsoft Teams or, or the Zoom that we're using for this council meeting tonight. It's just a matter of me getting out to each staff person who um, administers com com committee meetings. Sorry, I'm trying to use the word community and committee together there. Uh, committee meetings and making sure that uh, we're ready to meet. We're going to do so with physical distance in place and safe uh, practices. We are actually, and I think council would see uh, a draft media release that's, if not already out, going out quite soon to populate some committees where we have a shortage of members. Some, most are staggered committee appointments, so they don't end at the same time, but we do have a few vacancies to recruit. Some, like the library board, for example, are um, set to the term of council by provincial legislation. So those will come up before the end of the year as well. Um, and, then, and so, yeah, that's all we need to start having our committee meetings, and we will do so in the next month or, you know, maybe six weeks. Councillor? Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. CEO. All I got left to say is uh, looking forward to Canal Days this year, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> you and I both, Councillor. Councillor Danch. Thanks so much. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, I had a couple of mine answered already there. Uh, Brian with the marina for sure because I've had some boater guys uh, wondering what was going on. So thanks for that uh, wide range of information. Um, just for Chris there, uh, my wife's got me out uh, strutting the streets again and uh, along West Street there or along the uh, promenade. One of our light poles just past the Rankin property uh, that's going up the chain's all been pulled out of the bottom, and I know it's it's locked in place. Uh, it's just slightly south of the new rank in uh, construction there. You guys can take a look, maybe put it away before some idiot does something stupid with it. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. I was uh, going to have two questions, and then at uh, 620, I got a phone call, and I'd added a third question, so... I'll start with the last one first. Half of it was Councillor Beggar's question about committees opening up. The other one was, and I don't know who would best answer this, and perhaps yourself, Mr. Mayor, it involved the uh, cruise ship um, update. Um, so this came from a uh, merchant who had been talking to other merchants, and some of them were interested in ordering product for the coming season, some of it which would relate to some Port Coburn logo things or some nautical things or things that um, passengers on a cruise ship may be interested in. Um, it, according to him, the order time, as you can imagine, is, is, is maybe longer than we know the final answers to. What can you or we tell merchants who may want to anticipate the cruise ships and the launch. Anything in terms of numbers, start dates? I know we can't predict how many people on a ship will come off and walk um, West Street or into our downtown, but anything we can tell those merchants with that, the coming arrival of these ships? Great. And we do have Mr. Long and Mr. Higginbotham here, so I'll start with uh, Mr. Long. Uh, yes, good evening, uh, Council. You can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Greg, is, is with me. Uh, staff are actually in the process of organizing uh, and scheduling uh, a meeting with key stakeholders, in particular, uh, the business community. Mr. Higginbotham and I spoke this afternoon, actually, about this very meeting. Uh, he may be able to provide more details, but certainly the, the communications with the business community and engagement with them is very important to us. And uh, we, uh, we are making plans to, to reach out to them for a meeting in the next couple of weeks. Uh, maybe I'll turn it over to my colleague for more details. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Mr. Higginbotham? Yes, uh, through your worship to the councillor, uh, 
as Mr. Long has has already stated, yes, we we plan to do some uh, public uh, consultation and engagement with uh, with with the the community as well as uh, business owners. And we have received this question before about about preparations for the uh, for the cruise ship season, and and we'll be we'll be addressing that question and providing a, a more clear timeline uh, at that uh, meeting, which we're hoping to schedule for the next uh, in the next two to three weeks. Councillor. Um, you know, again, this came in at 620. I don't know what those lead times are, but two or three weeks may mean a world of difference, but I don't know the products and what it, any chance, um, maybe some just earlier, higher level indication. I would just hate to leave tonight with, uh, with them not knowing, and perhaps you could do this through the BIA. Um, I mean, even if there's a little probably inkling of help for their ordering again, two to three weeks may be fine but uh, uh, we were fast approaching 6.30 and I had to get off the phone. So um, anything you can do to expedite that would be appreciated. Um, and you don't have to deal directly with me if you, this was from a BIA member. So um, if, if you wanna proceed through them, thank you. Um, just wondering, I'm not sure who this would be. I think most people, if they've driven down Elizabeth Street have seen the new sign at uh, Vail. It's, uh, it's tremendous looking and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll, hopefully we'll have better uh, results with its longevity and quality than that. So whomever was involved in that, or if anybody wanted to speak to it, uh, thank you. I was there, happened to be there the day the crane was there. At, uh, and by the time I left, uh, they were gone. It was a, it was a um, minor hockey game I was at. And uh, so I don't know, I see Chris just um, came on there. I don't know if he wants to speak to it, if there's anything more that needs to be done or anything can be said about the type of sign, what it can do, how to send, put your message on it, all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Mr. Kalamuda. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to the councillor. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for noting that there is still some work uh, that needs to be done at the bottom, uh, doing some, some soil work and uh, making it look even nicer than it does now. We are just waiting for, again, the ground to uh, to dry up so that we can put the, the finally, final touches uh, onto that sign and then we can uh, we can have a good uh, a good ribbon cutting and photo shoot, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so it'll be uh, another week or two letting the, the soil dry up. Uh, we'll, we'll make it uh, nice and neat and then we can have the, the actual grand opening if you want to call it that uh, with the sign so um i know we'll we'll uh speak with uh, michelle i know that she was already um putting together some communication with respect to it uh and having uh the uh, the press there for some photos so we'll uh, we'll be doing that and can explain uh at that time what can and cannot be done with the sign as she'll be she's more of an expert than i am great thank you chris counselor Thank you, Chris. Um, and lastly, through you to, to yourself, uh, Your Worship, I'm just wondering, I had a, uh, another um, uh, constituent complaint, actually more than one, uh, uh, Highway 58 um, between Main Street and Coronation Drive. Um, it's uh, school crossing day tomorrow, and those school crossing guards there, I think, are um, probably the most at, at risk, although I'm sure there's uh, others that could tell stories of uh, that's uh, quite a uh, speedway there at times. And I'm just wondering if, uh, I'm not sure if that's regional or Ontario Provincial Police, I'm wondering if you could look into getting some radar and some checks there uh, on a more consistent basis and send a message uh, uh, to jurisdictional things. So perhaps with your experience uh, and contacts, Mr. Mayor, on the police board, you can let, let us know who is responsible and if we can get someone out there, whether that's through our local uh, um, staff sergeant or uh, headquarters. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. And I'll, I'll speak to the staff sergeant uh, uh, tomorrow. I know the province looks after the maintenance of that road, but I'll confirm with, uh, with the staff sergeant if, if we actually patrol that area or if it is under the OPP. So. Either way, we'll get uh, a call into whatever department is responsible and we'll uh, ask for that help in that stretch. Great, thank you. That's all I had. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Borgard. I have no remarks this evening. 
Thank you. I think that's everybody. I don't think I missed anybody. Good. Thank you, Council. Items requiring separate discussion. Item 8.1. I'm going to have Councillors Bruno and Wells move that Chief Administrative Office Report 2022-59 be received for information. We do have uh, Mary Lou Tanner, Principal Planner, NPG Planning Solutions. She will be giving us a presentation based on her work with our staff. And Mary Lou, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Steele and Council. It's my pleasure to be here again. I will be giving the presentation and uh, the clerk's team will be uh, operating the slide deck. So I'm pleased to be here uh, this evening to give you an update on the work we were asked to do to support the Waterfront Center uh, project and the application for funding. And this project uh, is a concept for how to uh, think about building out and the Marina District in and around the Waterfront Center, and also some thoughts and ideas for future conversations about growing this important part of the city. But I wanna say, first of all, uh, two things. First, thank the staff for the opportunity and, and council as well for the opportunity to provide uh, a contribution to this exciting project for the city of Port Colborne. And secondly, we were given um, a really wonderful part of the community because there's really wonderful community assets in this area of the city, some of which you've been talking about tonight. So it really did make our jobs quite enjoyable. And uh, I hope uh, we can contribute to um, further conversation about this part of the city. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is about building community around the waterfront center. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of really wonderful waterfront assets. And it's things like HH Knoll Park and Sugarloaf Marina, even access to the Lake Erie shoreline and the Welland Canal. And those are really, really important things for building uh, community around the new waterfront center. We'll go to the next slide, please. It's really important that we start to think about the waterfront area and, and talk about the principles that we want to do uh, and contribute to and implement through the design of any aspect of this area of the city. And it begins with the waterfront center itself and, and the significant investment and in thinking that has gone into that project and what it is gonna to bring to the, not just the city's waterfront area, but also the connectivity to downtown Port Colborne and westward into H.H. H. Noel Park and the marina. We think that active transportation and active placemaking are really important elements of this, contributing to excellence in design, leveraging green infrastructure, capitalizing on the waterfront assets, increasing housing supply and building new housing in this area, and creating connectivity and particularly to the Welland Canal, but also the Lake Erie shoreline and downtown Port Colborne. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is an overview of the land, land use concept that we created. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of really wonderful elements of the city that are found in this particular area uh, adjacent to the Welland Canal. So as, as you're aware, H.H. H. Knoll Lakeview Park is just a magnificent city asset and city waterfront park, including the gravel beach. The marina provides an opportunity for people to have boating and active use of the shoreline. And there are existing wonderful trails that uh, connect people from H.H. Knoll Park over towards King Street. And I think it's important that uh, I share with you that those were really the foundational elements that we looked at. And adding the waterfront center, you can start to see in this diagram how things can really start to connect through increased active transportation, uh, which is shown in the dashed green line, defining points of interest, such as the gravel beach, the restaurant and boat parking structures at Sugarloaf Marina, some of the key points that you just want to stand and look at uh, the wonderful water, the wonderful boats, the birds that are on uh, the lake and, and fly across uh, the harbor, as well as creating some new opportunities where there's a marina trail and new active transportation trails and further north around the waterfront center and capitalizing on the investment that's going to occur there. You can see in the orange areas, there are 
um, new mixed use uh, mid-rise buildings that we're thinking can uh, certainly be developed in this area. We haven't specified an actual height or density because those are further details that need to be worked out. But I also wanna note that it's really important. You'll see in those orange areas, the red, which shows active uses at grades. And that's things like cafes and restaurants, small shops. It's not to compete with downtown Col Port Colborne, it's to augment it. But providing a place for people to get an ice cream, get a drink, um, a lemonade, something like that, have a place to sit down in this area of the city. We can go to the next slide, please. So we have uh, developed a, a program uh, in two phases, and I want to first touch on this, which is the first phase. And there is an, a really wonderful multi-use trail uh, that connects HH Holt HH Knoll Park towards um, the Welland Canal. And we think building additional multi-use trails is an option. Some of them could be on King Street with uh, cycling lanes and uh, new sidewalks, but also connectivity through any new development. And I think that's an important principle. Any new development needs to have that active transportation that connectivity. Enhancing and connecting uh, the Waterfront Centre and this Waterfront neighbourhood to downtown Port Colborne is a really, really important thing to do. This area of the city has a fantastic grid street network, which is so important for creating that connectivity. The, the bones of those streets, those streets themselves, really do provide an easy way to direct people into downtown Port Colborne. And that is really, really good news for downtown, but also for the Waterfront Centre guests. We think Sugarloaf Marina is a real opportunity. It continues to have significant boating activity and, and just being able to create that connectivity to the waterfront center that this is really a waterfront city. And finally, an enhancement of the promenade and the waterfront center itself and really creating that promenade along the canal putting that public realm infrastructure in place. You can see as you look along the canal, we've got things like interpretive panels as suggestions, an ice rink or splash pad, um, a sail shade, which I'll show you an example of later, uh, an opportunity for food trucks and providing rooftop parks on tops of buildings. And you may think these are all uh, pie in the sky ideas. They're not. They happen in cities all over the world and you have the bones and the architecture to absolutely implement all of this. We've also spent some time thinking about flood mitigation, which I'll show you in a moment, and thinking about promenade programming as well and leveraging those spaces for activity. Let's go to the next slide, please. So phase two is retrofitting the grain terminal, and this is a longer term proposition. And I should note that we do recognize that the lands, uh, some of the lands are owned by Transport Canada, and this is by no means saying that Transport Canada needs to leave. In fact, the best waterfronts are working waterfronts where you have both industry and housing and active spaces and really integrate all of that into one particular waterfront area. So this is about a long-term vision and that future things can happen if those opportunities present themselves for some of those Transport Canada lands, but it's by no means that Transport Canada should leave the area far from it. But we did want to share with you ideas for retrofitting the grain terminal. And this happens in cities all over the world. And that grain terminal is at the southern end of uh, the pier. And it is an iconic building on the Port Colborne waterfront. And people come, whether they're coming from the west in Wayne Fleet or from the city of Port Colborne or in downtown or even from eastward or looking from the east towards the grain terminal, they see it on the waterfront. And it is a defined building on that waterfront that is so important to retain and keep for future use. So if there's an opportunity for retrofitting, I want to share with you an opportunity that you could think of in the future. So let's go to the next slide. So this, uh, what's come up on this slide is an area in the city of Copenhagen. And you may think that that's a significantly larger city than Port Colborne, and you'd be right. But they did take uh, a very similar waterfront neighborhood and transformed it from industry to support cruise ships and cruise ship terminals and put new housing and new active transportation and new active parks in that area. So it's shown in the left picture and it's highlighted in yellow. And we'll just add the next picture in please. And you can see here that new neighborhood. 
and see that all of those new buildings were built in an area that used to be industry. And you can see the cruise ships in the first photo. Now, this is a mid-rise neighborhood and some of these buildings may not be to your liking. Those two round ones in particular attract a lot of attention, but it is actually what we are talking about with mid-rise buildings with active uses at grade for pedestrian connectivity and drawing people to the community. And that grain terminal has been retrofitted to be new housing. So we'll go to the next slide, please. And this is what it looked like originally on the left hand side, you can see it's a green terminal, and then some of the exterior cladding that was done to add exterior cladding and then the final finished version. Now I acknowledge that this architecture is not everybody's taste. It is a very modernist style with metal, but it does show you that there is an opportunity to retrofit this green terminal if that presents itself and turn it into new housing. And what I think is important in all of this is let's not lose the good ideas. They may never come to pass. Most of them probably will. But think broadly and look at the opportunities that this grain terminal can present, that the waterfront center presents, that new active transportation presents, new trails present. And as this area unfolds, the continued attention to those details of active placemaking is really, really important. Next slide, please. So let's turn to flood mitigation strategies because this is on the Welland Canal and we did have good conversations and thank your staff for, for their insights on some of the issues that are potential for flood mitigation. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is um, along uh, the Welland Canal in the area where we've got race trail and step terrace. And these are some examples from the city of Calgary where they've put in flood mitigation. And this is a raised promenade and bike path. And you can see that it slopes down towards the water and it does provide opportunities for some seating. Next slide, please. This is a different approach to it, somewhat similar, but different. And you can see the uh, Muskoka chairs in this area. And it provides an ability for the water when it overtops to rise gently and not just run across uh, the trail, but also a way to capture it and slow it down as it rises and, and keep it um, within uh, the floodplain as well. And it gives people an opportunity to get a bit closer to the water and when water's not rising and to put some chairs out there and just let people have a, a place to sit. Next slide, please. These are some different approaches that uh, you can think about in terms of flood mitigation, a flood bench. So you see the bench and the trail and that uh, retains the water. The pedestrian entry points are clearly identified. And then the flood wall in West Eau Claire, as you can see in the lower picture, it's a similar version of what's uh, in the flood bench, but a different treatment with uh, the flood wall and defined pedestrian entry points and exit points. The point is you have opportunities to integrate active transportation with flood mitigation and addressing climate change along the Welland Canal, along Lake Erie, in ways that contribute to the overall city goals of new housing, new community, active placemaking. Can we have the next slide, please? And this is a different treatment, creating stone planters that work as temporary flood barriers. This is another option to put in some really lovely gardens and seating areas and add some uh, public art in the pavers. These are all things that you can think about and approaches that you can take in terms of addressing flood mitigation. It doesn't need to be a, a corrugated steel wall. There are different choices that you can make. Could I have the next slide, please? So some of the things that are also really important are active placemaking. And this, this area is inherently attractive to people. Waterfronts are inherently attractive to people. And the city has done an awful lot of really, really wonderful things with this waterfront. And as you look to the future, there's some things that are, are not terribly expensive investments, but things that take the waterfront just to that next level. So one of the things that all cities uh, have to deal with on their waterfronts where there are marinas is storage of boats. And there are opportunities to use repurposed shipping containers for smaller boats, not necessarily the larger boats, but the smaller ones, and adding murals to it. Creating public art is a wonderful opportunity. And in the staff report, in our broader report, we did identify another opportunity with the grain terminal, just a light show on the grain terminal. They're not terribly challenging things to do, but they do become really, really attractive things for people. And what we're showing on the right is a splash pad in the summer and an ice rink in the winter. And this is in Spencer Smith Park in the 
Spencer Smith Park in the city of Burlington. And it is a highly, highly attractive place for uh, wading. People take small boats and race them through this pond. They skate in the winter. It's on the Lake Ontario shoreline. And it's just a, an important thing of being a year round city and creating opportunities for people to be outside and be active year round in the city. Next slide, please. These are some other opportunities I mentioned earlier. So the Marina Trail with cycling and uh, pedestrian places, those are important things to do in, in building on the active transportation that you've already created. There are interactive activities. You know, there's so many wonderful different things that you can do in terms of light, such as the light show and the grain terminal, or this as these are just uh, teeter totters that light up, but things that attract people and give them uh, things to do in the waterfront and, and really provide opportunities for activity in the waterfront. And on the right are just uh, some netting where people can sit. And then those uh, sail shades that I talked about earlier, these are actually umbrella shades, but they're just larger uh, shaded structures to create some shaded areas on the waterfront, which keeps people at the waterfront year round. It allows people to be active and engaged with their city, and it gives them places to go to get out of their house. And coming out of this pandemic, one of the things we all really want is to be out and about and in our city. I know I certainly do. Can I have the next slide, please? So I just want to conclude by thanking you for the opportunity for doing this work. We have created uh, this waterfront concept to support the Waterfront Centre application. And on this particular slide, you will see some building typologies. And we included those in those orange areas to show you what buildings could look like. That doesn't mean they will, that will be the finer fo final form, but rather we wanted to show you that even with buildings, we are augmenting the green space. We are building the active trail system and network through that augmenting what the city has already done and making sure that there's, there are pedestrian places. So when visitors come to the Waterfront Centre, they can leave the Waterfront Centre after a wonderful visit, look around a great neighbourhood and say, I want to go visit. I want to go down to downtown Port Colborne. I want to go over to the park. I want to walk along the waterfront. I want to go watch boats. I want to go watch uh, what happens on Lake Erie. It really is a wonderful opportunity, and we really do thank you for the opportunity to work with you. That concludes my presentation. Great. Thank you, Mary Lou. I'll take questions from councillors. If there are, oh, actually, I've got two councillors on my list so far. So I'm going to go to Councillor Bruno first. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, I just want to start with a question to uh, Mary Lou and then perhaps broaden it uh, through uh, you to Mr. Kalamoto um, and, and perhaps Mr. Mr. Long, who's also working on the Waterfront uh, Center project. Um, Mary Lou, I've, um, I've noted in the past when the city of Port Coburn has done projects to be ready for grant applications by leveraging uh, consultant reports to paint the picture uh, to the granting agencies to um, to get funding uh, or joint funding to do more. And so I'm wondering with the extent of your knowledge in, um, in a report like this, and maybe it needs to be augmented and I'll, I'll go through where I'm thinking with this, but the report that you've done um, uh, for tonight, can can that have you use reports like that, or have municipalities that you've done reports for like this use those reports to leverage um, any funding from upper tier governments? Harry Lou, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I spent um, uh, several years working on the um, piers five to eight waterfront planning in the city of Hamilton. And it was exactly what is, is being looked at in Port Colborne, where it was, um, it was actually lands owned by the federal government that were transferred to the city of Hamilton. And through a number of granting years, the city was able to acquire funding for investment in a rink, actually, but more importantly, waterfront promenade, flood mitigation, as well as investment in new housing. And if you get the opportunity, um, if you're in Hamilton, please visit Pier 8 because um, uh -huh. the public infrastructure yeah. is being built and the housing is underway and it's going to be both affordable and attainable housing. So it's going to be a mixed income neighborhood. And having that neighborhood plan, which 
I completed about 15 years ago has been the basis for all of the successful funding applications that the city of Hamilton has had. So it's absolutely critical that this work is done. Councillor? If I could, what, what you said makes me want to pivot away from Mr. Kalamoto just for a second. But to, so the, the thing that struck me when I read your plan was just uh, actually two words in there. Um, and that was West Street revitalization was mentioned in your plan. Now we have a CIP for downtown. And when I look at the other report tonight on the pro progress of the Waterfront Center, you know, it says in there opening um, 2024, which means we could have a couple of years of pedestrians um, uh, landing at the pier there and potentially proceeding down west and into the downtown or down King Street. My concern is you take, um, you take, the, the development and building of that center, you take what looks like um, uh, a, a delay from COVID and weather of the um, new condo building uh, on West. And then you look at our CIP. And the worst case scenario I could see is that um, the waterfront center opens and we decide we do need as part of the CIP, West Street, water, wastewater, um, storm, hydro um, replaced. We've had a block that's been shut off for a year and a half, maybe going on two um, in front of the new condo building. And then we have the rest of West Street. I mean, the worst case scenario would be we open the waterfront center and we open and the condo opens and we want to send people down West Street and then we blow it up to put all those utilities in underneath. Granted, we have a promenade that allows those um, cruise customers to subvert the street and walk down the promenade. What I would like to see in a strategy is, and this is why it was going to be a Mr. Kalamoto question, but I also like your view on this, you know, to me, um, upper level of governments are looking at, we just have to look at tonight's report on the Waterfront Center. They seem to love um, the leverage that provides the tourism, uh, travel, um, employment, um, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we wanna see hard services, hard services, put in underground, which isn't that sexy, um, but, you know, is has to happen before at some point in the lifespan of the route from the waterfront center to um, the shops and the downtown. And, uh, and I'm just thinking that particular section, obviously, it goes to HH Null and other things in your, in your, uh, in your report. But do you see a way to leverage your report for, I guess what I'll call the unsexy underground services that provide that route into the downtown. At the end of the day, I would like to see CIP money start now, design start now, and do West Street perhaps in phases. And I wanna bring in Niagara Falls example, those of us who've been down Lundy's Lane the last three years. They let a contract, they do a phase from October through May. You go down there on May 1st, you never knew there was a construction firm in there for six months because they've left. That section of Lundy's Lane was built. And the next October, the next section of Lundy's Lane was done. And I've seen them do virtually that full lane from Clifton Hill almost now to uh, 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 Stanley. Um, and every summer there was no construction on it and every winter there was, and it, it looks very good now. And I'd love to see that, that happen um, between the Waterfront Center and say, for example, Victoria Street in year one, and then maybe in year two, it goes to, I don't know, 
uh, Charlotte. And then in year three, it finishes and crosses. This isn't about just doing West Street, West Street, West Street. This is about leveraging to get money that West Street needs to get done anyways in the CIP. So this is a long way around of asking you on the, on the leverage side, on the consultant side, do you see an opportunity that if we are painting the picture of what your plan does, the waterfront plan does, it's only uh, natural to present the route to and from waterfront center. So that's a lot to unpack there, but I'm just wondering if you have either seen or um, see an opportunity there with getting money for underground services because it needs to happen to leverage the rest. So I'll go to Mary Lou because it sounds like you're going to Montreal via Vancouver on that question. <laughs> so uh, Mary Lou, if you, uh, give us, if you give us an answer. Thank you, Mayor Still. So yes, absolutely. Um, there's opportunities uh, with the connectivity that we've identified and I, I've, I've seen it happen. Um, you know, I'll go back to the city of Hamilton where I worked for uh, quite a while. Um, we were able to leverage uh, grant money and federal programs and provincial cost shared programs for uh, underground infrastructure. Um, and it was because we had the concepts and the plans together uh, to uh, create that, um, that compelling case for all of that and, um, and leverage that money with the city's contribution. So it absolutely can be done. Thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you. And just to let everybody else know, we didn't talk beforehand. Is that correct? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so through you to Mr. Kalamoto, and then I'll relinquish the floor. Um, Mr. Kalamoto, do you think there is an opportunity to look at the infrastructure from Sugarloaf uh, north um, to, along the promenade? And I'm not sure if that is in the CIP. I'm not sure if there's enough money there now. We'll always need more to do that in phases. But can't you come back to us through you, or maybe with Mr. Long, to talk about if there's something that could be done there to put that project first in the infrastructure remix that has to happen in the CIP? If nothing more than to have somebody who arrives here in Court Coburn in 2024 at a new center um, that has to go through um, a lot of construction to see the rest of downtown. Mr. Kalamoto. Um, thank you. Uh, through the mayor uh, to the councilor, and if I'm understanding the question uh, exactly, um, taking a look at uh, the infrastructure there, um, the quality of the assets and when they would expect it to be replaced. That is kind of what we do with regard to asset management. Now, understanding what is going to be happening uh, specifically in West Street, we'll use that as an example. That one's uh, slightly easier just because it's the end of uh, the system. It's not really connected. It's only connected one way. It's north and south, but it's connected only at the, the other streets. It's, it's not looped. So with regard to that particular asset, it is a little bit um, easier to identify and do the replacement on that. Uh, again, depending on the replacement time frame, we could potentially move that up. So as an example, if the INS says that it should be replaced within the next uh, five years or five to 10 years, can that be moved up? Absolutely, because of the growth that, or the situation that's happening there with regard to uh, Mary Lou's presentation. If it is within a 15 to 20 year timeline, then that might be a political decision whether to move it up that much. And to say that, you know, because of the infrastructure, the above ground infrastructure that will be in place, we might want to replace that prematurely so that in 15 years from now, we don't go in. That is a particular uh, political uh, de decision and an overall decision. But as the INS will give us um, sort of the data as to the recommendations technically. Now, with regard to um, other streets that aren't West Street, that then depends on also the growth that's going to be happening. So with 
uh, the presentation uh, that Ms. Tanner did, if that it then leads to say the official plan identifying that particular growth in that particular area, the way that that presentation is, then the engineers would know what growth is going to be happening and can size the pipes more appropriately. And if once we understand when that growth is going to be happening, then that's when the assets could be upgraded and replaced at that more appropriate time. So that is kind of depends on how we move from just visioning the plan and, and then to actually putting it into particularly official documents like the OP and identifying at the appropriate time. So that's where, um, that's where it, it, it can happen. But I uh, just wanted to point out that the growth that uh, Ms. Tanner put into her presentation, uh, we actually sent to our consultant that is doing the INS as a larger picture and also understanding what the waterfront center would be. So all of that information is already going into the INS and it will be part of the recommendations coming out of that INS for that growth, the second aspect, that growth aspect that I just spoke about. Great, thank you both. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, that's all I have. Good, thank you, Councilor. Councilor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a, a couple questions and I'll start out uh, through you to Mary Lou, if I may. Um, there's a significant amount of truck traffic that goes down King Street going into the government elevators. Has there been any consideration with regards to how that would be managed so that it wouldn't distract the, the beautiful scenery that you've presented to us, the, the pictures of a, a nice waterfront there? So I don't know what kind of consideration has been given to that. Can you um, tell me a little bit more about that? Mary Lou? Uh, yes, thank you. So we did notice that, uh, particularly when we were out uh, walking around uh, the waterfront centre. It's one of those things that is going to have to be addressed through the overall design of King Street as part of the uh, future growth in the housing. Um, there are things that you can do uh, in street design to make sure that it's safe for pedestrians and cyclists, and particularly where the location of the pedestrian and cyclist um, active transportation routes are and where they are not, but also making sure that the, the street itself is um, built of a sufficient structure to support uh, that truck traffic. There, it's a working waterfront and, you know, it, it it's going to transition. And so managing all of these elements, I think what Mr. Kalamudu talked about in terms of the asset management strategy update and, and their consultant looking at the work that we've done in integrating that, that's going to help to build that street network that supports both the future growth, but also the truck traffic. Thank yeah, you. Just, just, um, for, just further to that, Councillor Wells, uh, between my office and, and, and staff out of uh, CAO and, and Mr. Long's department, we've been having those discussions with ADM Milling because they're the ones that have the majority of trucks that come in. Um, mm -hmm. So we're actually talking to them about that. And uh, I think Mr. Kalamoto was part of those conversations also. Um, so even in, in the smaller version of what we're looking to do, and if we can call it phase one with our waterfront building, uh, we're already in those conversations because we understand that, you know, both things have to work together as, as safe as possible. So, um, you know, we do have an active trail that runs through there now. And, uh, you know, with the mitigations that are, uh, aren't, aren't very large at this time, um, have been safe uh, to date. We, you know, we thank God for that. But uh, we will move forward, and, 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 and as, we, as we design things, uh, we obviously have to look down the road so that what we put in today will actually uh, fit right in with, with as we move south or east and west uh, in that area. So um, I think Mary Lou's plan is, is a good start to that. But those conversations have already started, so I just want to make sure Council knew about that. Go ahead, Councilor. That's great. Um, carrying on... Uh... Your presentation identified some uh, flood mitigation strategies, but it didn't identify any, I'll call it winter ice wind uh, strategies. Um, are there some good strategies that could be used to mitigate any damage from lake ice um, coming in from the heavy winds that, that Port Corbin experiences? Mary Lou? Uh, that that's a thank you. Sorry, Mayor. Still, th thank you. That's a that's a really good question. So, the the flood mitigation strategies that we identified that will do some of it. Calgary is a winter city. Uh, other cities um, along 
Lake Ontario, all of the Great Lakes do have some um, mitigation strategies. Um, the reality is Lake Erie ice is Lake Erie ice and, uh, and mother nature will generally win. So the things that uh, are done, such as the gravel beach over at HH Knoll Park and getting the boats out of the water and protecting the dock infrastructure, those are all really, really important things to continue um, in terms of uh, wind um, you know, it's going to be windy down there in the winter. It is windy down there in the winter. Um, new buildings and building design and making sure that the new buildings have uh, safe pedestrian environments. That's an important architectural design that can be done. And it, it will give people a shelter if there's a big burst of wind that gives them a place to just get out of that wind as well. Councillor? Thank you, Mary. I have one more, one more question. Um, and um, you've talked about integrating the uh, redevelopment uh, of this area or the revitalization of this area into other areas of Port Coburn. Um, one of the aspects that um, I didn't see referred to or mentioned in the report was the aspect of the view from the revitalized marina, i.e. we are the view from patios or rooftop windows uh, along there is easterly, mainly easterly and across the canal is not a very nice uh, view. Is, has there been any discussions in, or with regards to that? I don't know if you can answer that or maybe even Mr. Mr. Long could, could answer that, but um, it's nice to have a beautiful uh, uh, one side, but a not so beautiful other side kind of distracts from all the, the things that we've done on the, on the west side. Mary Lou? Uh, thank you, Mayor Steele. So I, I'm going to somewhat respectfully disagree with you. Um, I live in Hamilton, and it's a highly industrialized waterfront. And, uh, you know, to me, one of the most beautiful, beautiful views of this city is coming over the Skyway Bridge at night and seeing the lit up industrial waterfront. It's a reality. It's a working waterfront. The view eastward is what it is. You can create and a compelling story about the history of Port Colborne and Port Colborne's place on Lake Erie with, you know, interpretive panels and view, viewing places to HH Knoll Park and looking westward, but also looking eastward. It's a, you're partly an industrial city. I, I would encourage you to celebrate that heritage. Councillor. And thank you. I, I, I agree with you. I worked in Hamilton many years uh, down on the waterfront right at the end of Parkdale. And um, I, I know that at night when you don't see the ugliness and the lights are all beautiful, it looks great. But during the day when you have the odors and you have the, the busyness and everything else, it, it does distract from, from the good side. Um, so I, I will tend to, to uh, agree to disagree with you on that one there and to leave it at the beauties in the eye of the beholders. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Demeray. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bruno asked my question, so uh, I don't have anything else. Thanks. Oh, great, we got some time back. Councillor Baggy. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not gonna go to Vancouver, to Montreal. I'm going to Winnipeg. But um, <laughs> actually, Mary Lou, I wanna thank you for this re consultant's report. My three and, a year, three and a half years of council is probably the best consult report I've seen yet. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I like how you think outside the box, uh, the the rink, the outdoor rink in, the, in that, and the splash pad out there, the trails. Maybe a council dancer loses another five pounds of more trails out there. Or he can pick up more garbage, whatever. Uh, the only thing I did see was the big zip line. Like I like zip lines and uh, I talked to uh, Director Bowles and uh, hopefully we get a zip line from the Welcome Center right to HH Gold Park. Thank you, Mary Lou. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Uh, seeing no further questions, <laughs> all the, oh, sorry, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, I, I, I had one more question and this one would be directed through you to uh, 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 Manager of Strategic Initiatives, Mr. Long. And the, the question is, uh, Gary, um, back in 2019-2020, the uh, Recreational Master Plan for Parks and Recreation identified the need for a waterfront 
a, a master waterfront strategy. And there was, and that included all of the waterfronts within Port Coburn. Uh, I know uh, that that hasn't been done yet, and, but will that be considered? And will this uh, revitalization plan become part and parcel of that master waterfront plan? Mr. Long? Yeah, through you, uh, Mayor Steele, to the councillor. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fair point. And uh, I think as council is aware, we have uh, quite an active staff committee uh, comprised of key staff from various divisions that are meeting on a monthly basis to talk about the parks and recreation master plan and the implementation of the recommendations uh, in that plan. So it is something that, that we are talking about. And uh, certainly I think the draft concept plan that Mary Lou and her team have brought forward tonight it can be a basis for uh, a broader uh, strategic discussion on Port Colborne's, Port Colborne's waterfront. That would include the west side of the canal and the marina and uh, sort of that part of the waterfront. And then we go east to Nickel Beach, you know, Cedar Bay and, and elsewhere. So um, I, I appreciate uh, how the councillor is positioning this uh, this issue and we can certainly take that away because I think it's it's a good point and, and a good approach. Councillor? Thank you. Great, thanks. I apologize for skipping to the next. I thought you were done on that one. Um, okay, no further questions, councillors? All in favor, please raise your hand. This is to receive. Unanimous, thank you, council. Uh, next is item 8.3. I'm going to have Councillors Bruno and Baggy move this. The recommendation is that Chief Administrative Office Report 2022-37 be received for information. This is the Waterfront Centre Project Update. Uh, Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'm going to try and do that without thinking about Councillor Baggy zip lining off the ADM mill. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I got my thoughts together here now. Um, Thank you for the excellent report. Um, I'm, uh, I, I think, well, actually I should back up a bit. It's not a report, it's an update, which actually uh, changes the whole context of this because I think many of the questions that could be asked tonight can't be answered because it's an update and we're not far enough along to answer some of them. I am gonna throw the one in that I would like further clarification on down the road. Um, I, um, was able to get further information during the day with respect to the capital funding and um, answered really all my questions on it. Um, very impressive. What I really like, uh, though, is um, the conservative number on uh, on the mat funding that will carry the debenture. Um, that lends me more and more um, supportive in terms of the financial side of this project. When I, when I look at what I think is realistic there and conservative, I'm comforted by the fact that those numbers uh, don't seem to be pie in the sky at all. And the fact that when I went through with Mr. Bowles, the amortization, and the projected interest rate on the debenture, it um, actually provides free board if some of those funds don't come through as stated in the, uh, uh, I guess I won't really call it a pro forma, but uh, uh, in the chart that's presented. So I, I'm more comfortable um, than I have been in a long time that the funding can be received. Uh, with respect to a question though, I would really like to see um, on the operational side. For me, it, I know it's high level. I just, when you come back, I need more detail on that. It seems, um, you know, the, the numbers, uh, uh, although they balance on the expenses and on the uh, revenue, I, I, I really need more detailed justification that the ongoing operating costs can be carried. Uh, lastly on that, um, I would like to see 
um, if we if it's not too late to look at design build on this building. And the reason I say that is, um, A, it's not a very complicated building, but if you really want to control costs and get some creative thinking and ideas, if you put out there what your spend is as the upper limit and then have the construction firms um, come back to us with how uh, they can make that number work, I, I think we run less of a risk into some cost overruns. It's not a perfect science, but I think given the nature of this building, um, I think we could get some interesting ideas um, in a design build format and not have the lift of uh, the value of the project also helps determine the architect's uh, final fee. So I, I would like to, uh, to answer a question on, can we look at design build? And um, other than that, for now, um, good job at getting this in a position that ultimately could be on the build side, at least no impact uh, on the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Long, you want to answer that question? Yeah, through, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to Council. Um, yeah, we can certainly we can certainly take a look at uh, at that model. Um, the city received uh, ten proposals uh, from architecture and engineering firms uh, over the last uh, month or so. We have a city evaluation committee that's in the final stages of, uh, of of selecting a firm to bring forward to council at the April twelfth council meeting as part of a a report and recommendation. Um, so we're, we're moving fairly quickly um, to, to have that firm put in place with, with council approval. If we need to go sideways and, and just take a step back, um, provided there's council direction for that, you know, we can certainly do that. I guess I would just be concerned about impacting the, the timelines, uh, which are important for a number of reasons, including the... Uh, the stipulations around um, funding that we've received from the, the federal government and other funding that we expect to receive from both the feds as well as the, the provincial government. So uh, I just wanted to, I guess, put that out there. I, I, think, I think it's also important to note that uh, staff take the budget for this project very, very seriously. And um, the oversight of this project uh, Will be very important. So, um, you know, we're not uh, we're not going to stand for cost overruns or budget overruns. Um, I can assure you. So, that being said, uh, we'll certainly take that back uh, to our committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, thank you for that. And I, I take it on the other on the um, operating costs. You can look into that and come back with us with more um, uh, uh, back back up to those numbers. Um, just back to the to the um, uh, design build. Um, I guess my concern is not just the upper limit on the price, which, which certainly you can control with an architect. What, what I like about design build for a building like this is we come in with all the list of things we wanna do, but more importantly, um, you get a number of creative thinkers coming back to how best laid out this building. And I can only point to the design build that I know that was the most successful, and that's the Meridian Center in St. Catharines. So as a result of that, it came in on time and on budget, but also there were um, some things in various um, construction bidders um, proposals that were actually um, in, incorporated into the winning bid. So that, what, what I like about it is they got lots of ideas from people who know how to do it and have built lots of buildings. Uh, that, that's all I'm saying. So with respect to your um, direction um, concept, um, I mean, just, it, I mean, the other way of doing this is you take the architect's plans and you make an agreement with him that says, you know, Thank you very much. This is, um, we've agreed to take your plan. We're not gonna 
abuse it. We're not going to give it to anybody else. We're going to do it just on this project. And you let the contractor make some additions there. So that's another way, if you're too far down the road, that you can um, still control costs, still get a variety of bids and thoughts, and use the architect's drawing, but you've at least capped your fee there. And most good architects who know someone like the city of Port Coburn might have some more work down the road, tend to agree with that copy for the work, and uh, but you cap that bidding process. So as long as that could be looked at, um, if you're telling me um, you have to have direction tonight, I, I think I'd rather have you go back and, and tell me if uh, it's not too late or if that alternative of working with an architect at a fixed fee and then going to the construction industry will work. So I think I need a little bit more information from you and hopefully two weeks won't be uh, too long. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Mr. Bowles? Now through South Mayor to the Councilor and Council, um, having been through this situation before uh, where an organization's gone out and RFP'd for the, uh, the architect, what, what can happen to achieve the uh, kind of the, the spirit of the design build is we can still go out and hire in advance a contractor and bring them in on a separate contract and they can work in tandem to effectively achieve the design build where we have the architecture, architect and the, uh, and the general contractor on, uh, on the project at the same time. So I think we can achieve uh, what, uh, what you've suggested without really adjusting our timelines or our, our budget. So we can, I'm happy to say that as staff, we can take that away and work that into our operating model. Uh, for this project. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all I have. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bagu. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, too, I guess Director Bowles, I have looked online at some of the welcome centers for the cruise ships in Canada, some of the upgrades in that, and the funding always seemed to be about 33% across the board, uh, locally, provincially, and federally. Well, in your opinion, is this gonna be about the same? Mr. Bowles? Yeah, well, I, I think as we laid out in the Appendix A, I, our goal ultimately is to raise about 2.7 million on the grant side, with a total project costs uh, in the neighborhood of about 5.5 million. Uh, Technically, I guess the, the project that we put forward doesn't actually use any levy dollars. It would be from sale of infill lots and naming rights, um, as well as using the, uh, the mat uh, that we'll be proposing, uh, I guess, in the next report that we might be discussing to fund a municipal debenture. So I don't know if we quite get to the third, 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 but that is a common model for a lot of projects. But that also comes under very specific funding grants. And you'll notice with this project, we've, we've had to kind of go to a multiple um, individual grants we've had to apply for. And uh, to be fair, I think the, um, our economic and strategy team have done a great job. They've applied for more grants and, and, and working on more grant opportunities than what I think have been necessarily identified here. But these were ones at the time of the report that might have been the most promising, it, you know, as and as we've identified, two of them still say pending, and they may not uh, come through. One, one actually, we have a, a feeling that uh, may not actually um, progress, but we have a couple others that are out there, and we do anticipate we'll find the success in one of the other applications. So to answer your, I guess I went to Winnipeg and to Vancouver and maybe to Montreal with that answer. Um, <laughs> Councillor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. He's been hanging around Councillor Bruno too much. <laughs> uh, my other one here is uh, I did send an email to Mr. Long today asking about uh, who was on the committee, the staff committee. And he sent me the names, which is fine. I, I do appreciate it. I know it's a lot of work. The funding the staff for grants is doing great. Uh, I, I admire them, the hard work they're doing. Now, what I'm going to put in here is sort of like Councilor Bruno talked about design build. Maybe it's premature, but 
nowadays with climate change and uh, people talk about renewable energy and fossil fuels, carbon footprint to me is very important for this build. Um, I know we talk environment, we talk more money and everything else, but um, I was just hoping that, uh, I guess what I'm looking for through the CAO, I guess, is uh, his commitment to take into consideration for this project and others going forward, the climate change, carbon footprint, and the use of renewable resources take a big uh, percentage in the planning of uh, our building of uh, structures, I guess you call it, and probably everyday operation. It is getting a lot more serious, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I think our residents do expect the low carbon footprint on this build and uh, not so much the uh, biodiversity offsetting like was first proposed in Niagara Falls, which uh, I don't think anybody's for. So uh, that's what all I got to say about that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. I'm going to go to uh, sorry, CIO Louis first. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Bagu, uh, your suggestion is noted. Uh, I think do, I do think staff <clears throat> has embraced the the principles, the environmental principles that you've just laid out. That philosophy, which I, you know, uh, there hasn't been a vote, but I assume to be the philosophy of all of council. And I can tell you that uh, the recent procurement bylaw that was approved by council I think just before the end of the year last year does have a climate change component it is um, it is a uh, is now part of our scoring matrix for all of the purchases the city makes whether it's playground equipment construction of a new building like this or any other aspect of our capital or operating spending so, because it is in the procurement policy councilor uh, thank you, Mr. Lee. To you, Mr. Mayor, I think this Welcome Center could be a uh, a real great building, a showcase for other municipalities to uh, see how our carbon footprinting will work on this, Mr. Mayor. So, thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Good. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clayloff. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure if this is to Mr. Bowles or who, but I just wanted to make a comment. I was thrilled to look at some of the plans and see the rooftop uses. I took a drive down to St. Catharines and I had a look when I was there at the games building and to see the new roof, it's exciting to see the use of it and to see green roofs and all the things. I'm with um, Councillor Bagu on that. I think the more that we can do, the more naturalization, the greening of all of it, I think it's going to be better for all of us. And we won't have to worry about having to Bury, bury our sins as, as we're having to do right now with some of the things that have been done in the past. But um, if you have a chance, go and look at that building that just finished in St. Catharines. It's beautiful. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any further questions? Seeing none, duly moved and seconded. It is to receive. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. Item 8.4. Municipal accommodation tax, the recommendation. I'll have councillors um, Bruno and Wells move this. The Chief Administrative Office Report 2022 48 be received. The council commit in principle to implement a municipal accommodation tax, known as MAT, M A T, of no more than 4% on the purchase of transit, transient accommodation at campsites, campgrounds, effective January 1st, 2023. The manager of strategic initiatives be directed to draft and bring forward a MAT bylaw, an agreement between the Corporation of the City of Port Coburn and Niagara's South Coast Tourism Association, a municipal accommodation tax reserve policy, and a procedure for collecting and remitting a MAT to a future meeting of council consideration. And that the manager of strategic initiatives be directed to further engage campsite, campground businesses on the implementation and collection of a MAT in the City of Port Coburn. I'm going to go to Councillor Bruno first. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, like the concept, certainly as the report says, uh, used in two, two communities in Niagara and many places around the world. Um, it's, um, it's tourism income supporting tourism 
um, business or a building in this case um, and all that goes with it. So um, I'm supportive of the idea. It takes uh, helps um, fund to the tune of maybe 40 to 30 to 50 percent of uh, this build. It's not on the levy. It's new. Re it's new revenue. It, it, it has a source. There are two components of this, though, that I would like to see changed and amended. Uh, one is um, not just in the campground industry, but in general tourism industry right now, particularly a seasonal one. Um, starting the mat on January 1st, 2023 takes about 33 to 40% of the potential revenue off the table. So in other words, people today in the campground industry and rental accommodations in particular on campgrounds are either booking their next year's vacation if they love it um, when they leave their this year's vacation. Secondly, they're offered various inducements between when they leave and January 1st to pay early and book. So if you start January 1st, you are gonna lose uh, a fair bit of revenue off the table. Um, I talked to Mr. Bowles about this. I've spoken to um, Mr. Higginbaum about it. Uh, our conversation though was particularly more about um, uh, what constitutes campsites. I've had further clarification of that and things like rental um, park model trailers would be included in those RV sites. I did have some questions about the percentages that are transient. I've had those confirmed. They are a little bit lower than the report states. Notwithstanding that, the principles of uh, this report, I think, are strong. Um, I know that um, from conversations that um, uh, the lawyer that would draft this agreement um, to set up the mat has done um, other ones. I strongly urge that she and they be um, uh, asked to meet a September 1st deadline to not leave that 33% uh, or more on the table. So I'll be proposing that September 1st be that. Um, and secondly, um, when you look at the background of other communities that have MAT, particularly as it relates to campgrounds, there are some in Northern Ontario that are municipally owned campgrounds and they, to their credit, did not um, uh, isolate themselves out of MAT. In other words, they had a accommodation business and they put the MAT on their own business. And I'm not suggesting that we're being a bit hypocritical here, but I did investigate with our marina. Um, while small and getting smaller, more of it being seasonal, more of it being over 28 days, transient boating at the marina is not picking up Port Coburn customers. It's out of town customers. The marina managers assured me that a lot of those folks are, uh, the majority of those, the vast majority, 90%, I think was his number, um, accommodate on the boat for their short-term stay of less than 28 days. I think it would be appropriate, fair, and equitable if we looked at the mat tax on transient voters. It would be a very small income level, but I think it shows that the city is not just looking at the private sector, but has the uh, fortitude to also put the tax on its own customers at its marina. Those would, this would not include any seasonal boaters there. It would not really include any Port Coburn boaters who stay in a flip for less than 28 days. So I'm just wondering through you, and perhaps I'll ask Mr. Bowles because he was the one I was able to talk to on the first issue about moving the date. And uh, so I threw in the second issue at the time about transient boaters. Since he oversees the marina, I would like um, his thoughts on Mr. Those Bowles. Two. Uh, through the through the mayor to the councillor and council, I uh, had a great uh, opportunity to talk to uh, Mr. Higginbotham about this as well. Moving up the date is something we can definitely do. So a uh, date adjustment is is no um, is no problem to 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 handle. So if council wishes to amend uh, uh, the report and give that direction, that can be done. Uh, with respect to the marina. Uh, 
Um, the reality is when we look at our, uh, our current annual slip holders, um, we do have something in the, in the documentation that they signed to, to use the slips that they can't rent their boats out. So because of that, we hadn't thought of this. And I think what the counselor brings up with the transient is, is uh, perfectly um, appropriate and staff would be happy to accommodate that on the transient voters. Counselor? Uh, thank you. Do I have to put that forward as an amendment now or wait till you go around the table? No, I mean, you've started talking about it. So I know you uh, have been speaking to staff. The clerk has given me uh, proper wording uh, prior to the meeting. So if I can uh, have you put that on the floor, I'd rather deal with it now and then we can uh, deal with that and then other people can ask their questions. Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. If, uh, if you have that wording uh, available, then uh, yes, I'd like to put forward a motion to amend the start date of the mat to September 1st, uh, 2021. And with respect to uh, the eligible uh, transient accommodations that we um, uh, apply the mat on ourselves at our marina to transient voting only under 28 days. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor. Uh, just before I go to Councillor um, Wells to see if he'll second that, I'm just going to read what the clerk had written here. So it is the second paragraph, or well, the real true first paragraph after B received. It would now read that council commit in principle to implement a municipal accommodation tax, MAT, of no more than 4% on the purchase of transient accommodation at campsites, campgrounds, and the city marina, effective the September 1st, 2022. Councillor Wells, are you okay seconding that? Okay, thank you. So it is duly moved and seconded. Questions to the amendment? Councillor Danch. Okay, so you just want to understand what you're saying here. So if I'm a boater, I'm a transient boater, and I come into Port Colborne, I stay three, four days. No, no tax on that, or yes, I'm going to be taxed on that. Mr. Bowles? Uh, through yourself, Mayor, to the Councillor, that boater will be taxed. There will be the 4% the uh, tax on that boater, that transient boater. Okay, so... And as much as I haven't been a voter, as much as I'd like to be due to what I do, um, I, I won't support that. I mean, if you want to get people to come in, you can't be nailing them every time they pull up to your dock, they, they fuel up at your dock, they support your, your, your restaurant, your downtown merchants, uptown merchants, and then you want to charge them 4%. I'm, I'm, I won't support it. You do what you want. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions on the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. So now we're back to the motion as amended. Any questions on the motion? Councillor Wells, you were on the list. Did you have any questions or no? Thank you, Mayor. To you, to Perfect. Director Bowles, um, how is this program going to, how is the MAT program going to be managed? I, I'm going to ask you that. I know all the details aren't worked out yet, but can you give me a rough idea on how this is going to be managed? Is it a, a honor system based program or are we going to actually have uh, people go out and uh, review and inspect the sites and locations that are going to be used for the transient camping? Mr. Bowles? Yeah, through the mayor to uh to the councillor and council it's a good question because the reality is um you know a hundred percent certainty on this or the completeness is the accounting word uh, that people often use is a difficult one to do because certain people pay in different ways and the documentation of that is reliant on the records of the uh of the party to which you're applying the tax to we will have the ability to do a review at this point in time. We're still working out the details if we're actually going to have somebody do an inspection. Uh, we do plan to have ongoing conversations with those that it applies to in order to ensure that there is compliance. Um, and I guess the best I can say right now is if we find the need that we have to Im implement additional procedures for compliance, for review, um, we would bring that to council to let council know that we have to do additional uh, work there. 
at the present time and as foreseen in rolling it out, we don't foresee ourselves actually going out and doing the full audit. We do view it more as an honor system at the present time, but we would have the ability to go out and do a check should we feel it's required. Councillor? Thank you. I have one more question through you to Director Bowles. Um, how will the proceeds from this uh, program be handled so that we maintain compliance with the regulation 435.17? Mr. Bowles? A great question through the mayor to yourself and the rest of council. So I think in the report we identified our initial estimate is about $100,000 it would bring in. Um, there's a 50-50 split, so the city would get 50% and the Niagara South Coast Tourism Association, uh, to which the city ultimately is ownership as the sole member, uh, gets the other 50%. Um, the city's 50% portion would ultimately be used towards the waterfront facility. And then in the Niagara South Coast Tourism 50% portion, part of it would go back into uh, an agreement to support the waterfront facility and the remainder would be used for uh, tourism activities within the city uh, itself. Now currently the city also does fund the Niagara South Coast Tourism Association. So as we move into implementing this into the 2023 budget year, the city could determine and have a conversation should they want to maintain that, that funding level or use some of these funds to do that. And that'll be, I think, a conversation for the 2023 budget as we start to roll this program out. Councillor. Thank you. That's it for my questions. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Borgard. Uh, through your worship to Director Bowles or Gary Long or, or um, Mr. Higginbottom. Uh, any, if, if a resident were to use uh, or to book a, a camp, a, a campsite, for example, in Port Colbert, would they be subject to this tax as well? Mr. Bowles? Yeah, through yourself, Mayor, to Council, and I, I stand to be corrected. Um, it, it applies to the site. It's not applying to the resident itself. So it, it, it's 100%. It's whoever rents that site would end up paying for that. And I, if, if I'm incorrect in that, I, I hope our team will step up and tell me so. No, no, you're, you're correct, uh, Director Bowles. Yes. The, uh, I can speak on my own behalf as a resident of, of Niagara Falls. If I were to stay at a Niagara Falls hotel, the Niagara Falls does have a MAT program. I would be subject to paying that MAT despite being a resident. Councillor? Um, there are, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I thought, I, I thought um, in the city of Niagara Falls, I thought if you're a local resident, you could prove that you're local, you, you were exempt from the tax. Has that not changed? Or am I just mistaken? Mr. Higginbotham? Yes, uh, through your worship to the councillor. To my knowledge, no, the, there is no, no local exemption. There, there, may be, uh, there may be an exemption to a destination marketing fee that uh, the city of Niagara Falls uh, also implements, but that fee is, is a voluntary fee. It's not a tax. And therefore, uh, I, I do know that residents have, have asked to have that uh, fee be removed from, from their receipts because it is it is a voluntary fee and it is not a tax. Councillor? Okay. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? And that's carried. Item 8.5 is, is a referral that is coming back to us, Council. Friendship Trail Standard Crossing and Signage. The recommendation that Public Works Department Report 2022-49 be received. That Council approve the crossing standard as shown in Exhibit A in Appendix A to Public Works Department Report 2022-49. The Council approve the installation of 14 sign boards and 11 wayfinding markers for the Friendship Trail crossings as shown in Exhibit B in Appendix B to Public Works Department Report 2022-49. If I could have Councillors Wells and Bodner move that, I'm gonna to go to Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to Director Kalamoto. Uh, I know we've had some correspondence regarding this back and forth, um, but uh, just for everybody that's watching, if, if we could just um, 
maybe clarify the 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 full gamut of what we're looking at here is that um, if you could just to explain at that uh, you know what portion of the trail is going to be looked at and when the rest of the trail may look be looked at. Mr. Calamato. Yes, uh, thank you through the mayor uh, to the council and everybody watching. Uh, this particular one was just a matter of time and resources. So engineering staff uh, prioritized the Friendship Trail uh, because of its because of the previous council request, uh, the current capital budgets that were in the budget and uh, the pending Canada Games. So this uh, Friendship Trail for those watching uh, is basically from, well, it, it extends past our, our borders, but within Port Colburn, it's from Holloway Bay uh, to Clarence, Clarence Street. And again, uh, for those reasons, that's why uh, we focused on, on the, that particular trail. Uh, staff can utilize the lessons and the recommendations that were developed for Friendship Trail. And if after analysis, uh, the same canon should be used for other trails within the city, staff can come back uh, and make those recommendations to council at a, at a later date. Um, however, as, as Council has experienced with this report, uh, there is a lot of work that, that goes into this analysis and uh, the other trails uh, would not be able to be done until sometime next year. They, uh, the other trails do differ with regard to topography, uh, the speed of cars, uh, the sight lines, and uh, they're actually part of the greater uh, Niagara Circle route, so it's kind of a different route than the Great, Greater Lakes Waterfront Trail that's going to be utilized for the uh, Canada Summer Games. So um, hopefully that gives some, some, some clarification. And if there are any uh, uh, technical questions, um, Mr. Ant is here uh, also to, to answer them uh, probably better than I can. Great. Thank you, Chris. And welcome, Mr. Ant. Uh, Councillor? Uh, thank you, Director Kalamoto. I think it's important for us to establish a consistent pattern to the trails so that when cyclists and users of the trail go from one the Friendship Trail to the Greater Niagara Trail or to any of our other trails, they uh, have this similar experience. They understand what the signage means and that um, the message that we're putting across is, is consistent and that we've addressed all the safety issues in the same and similar manner. So I, I would uh, encourage us to, to look at this and make this a, an additional program for 2023. Thanks, Director Kalamoto. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Demaray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to Director Kalamoto. Um, Chris, did you, uh, for some reason, I think uh, what you had said is the Friendship Trail um, is looked at as separate from the, the Greater Niagara Circle route, because I just want to let you know that it is not, it's actually part of that route. Um, so we need to understand that. And for that reason, we do need to have consistency with the signage. So. Um, with signage and the way we apply all the changes. If we can find a way to be consistent across all of our trails, that's a battle we've been having for more than 10 years, trying to establish that within the region, uh, both on the regional committees and on our local committees. So if we could find a way to, to keep that mindset um, and work toward that, I know you can't do it all in one year, but certainly uh, going forward, that would be a great thing. And understand that all of the trails, uh, the the uh, Welling Canal Trail and the Friendship Trail, are all part of the Greater Niagara Circle route, um, and were established as a result of that, because of that that route. But uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Thank Councillor. And and the director was was commenting on that the 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 Canada Games was only using the Friendship portion of that. I like guess he was trying to differentiate that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Anything to add, Chris or, or Ms. Durant? Uh, through you to the mayor, obviously there are would be some areas, uh, as I stated before, that we can have similarities, and then there are areas where we cannot have similarities. Again, as I noted, because of certain topographies, because of speed of cars, because of sight lines, because of where the crossings are, they cannot be the same, and there are differences with regard to the Friendship Trail, and even within the Friendship Trail, the suburban areas and the rural areas will look slightly different. But as an example, the signs can be uh, very, very the same, basically. They might be in a different area. So it's not um, a specific uh, standard, but it is the same use of those things. So those can absolutely be uh, standard, standardized for those type of things. 
And then there are the specific crossings that we analyze as in individuals. So um, super, uh, technologist Durant's uh, team, her and her team have examined uh, each of the crossings and made them the same where they can. And with the, with the um, uh, support and help of the communications department, signage is something that can have the same look and feel, although it may not be exactly the same because of the intricacies of each crossing. So um, we can uh, take Councillor Wells's recommendation uh, into consideration and start looking at uh, the rest of uh, the trails within the city. And we have been working with um, the, the region and uh, the Greater Niagara Circle route to try to have consistency uh, throughout not just uh, Port Colburn, but the other areas uh, within, within, at least within Niagara, as we've been talking to. So um, Technologist Durant has reached out uh, to many uh, different committees. Uh, and again, as I said, there was a lot of work that was put into the, to, to this particular uh, section of the Friendship Trail uh, to ensure that we have consistency as much as we can and not just consistency within the city, but also within uh, the Greater Niagara Circle uh, route. Thank you, Mr. Kamala. So we'll expect that for the 2023 budget, you can do the next phase uh, of, of the trail system that you'll be coming uh, to council with that? Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, we can uh, take a look at the analysis uh, so that we can, we can do within, uh, within the next year. And then those recommendations can come to, to council within the next year, depending on uh, what the analysis shows and what the needs show. We can then come back. I'm not sure if it'll be 2023 uh, budget for this because uh, we, we have to do the analysis first, but we can definitely do that in the next year, come to the budgetary process in 2023 for the 2024 budget. Uh, if Technologist Direct uh, takes a look at the analysis and says that we do need some uh, capital budget money to implement uh, her recommendations. Okay, great. Is that okay with council then? Okay, see so your head's nodding. Perfect. Thank you. Any further questions on this one? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. Thank you, council. Next item is item 8.7, Port Coburn Distribution System, the 2021 Annual Summary Report, and the recommendation that Public Works Department Report 2022-60, prepared in accordance with the requirements of Ontario Regulation 170-03 under the Safe Drinking Water Act 2002, be received for information. I have Councillor Wells and Bodner moving that. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to commend, uh, commend the water and wastewater team, first of all, for uh, their efforts, uh, great efforts to maintain and improve the quality of the water that uh, the city provides to its residents. Um, it is very important uh, for the residents to be aware of what the city does in order to ensure this quality um, of the drinking water and feel confident that the water they, they get from the distribution distribution system is safe. So I think it's important for us to um, brag a little bit or allow the white wastewater, uh, the water and wastewater team in order to give us some of the highlights of their year um, in order to establish the, uh, the report and the quality of the water. So uh, I would like to ask if, if possible, I don't know whether it would be Darlene or Cassandra, uh, or Chris that would, would do that, if one of those could give us a little bit of uh, a taste of the highlights uh, that they encountered throughout the year. Great, thank you, Councillor. I'll go to Ms. Sutter if she wants to say who's gonna start, either you or Ms. Banting. For sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, through, you may, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor um, Wells, thank you very much for the opportunity to brag. Um, as you say, um, a lot of work goes into uh, maintaining the drinking water in Port Colburn and making sure that we meet all of the legal requirements. Um, some of the things, some of the highlights from 2021, um, we exceeded our minimum regulatory sampling requirements. We did more, more than 3,500 samples were collected and analyzed in 2021. 
We have a comprehensive flushing program that targets dead ends where water use is not very high to ensure that the chlorine levels are maintained. We have been responding very promptly to water main breaks and consumer complaints, uh, making sure that we, we get out there and help our residents. We have continued to work on reducing our unbilled water uh, throughout the distribution system through leak detection, uh, responding to any water main breaks promptly to get them repaired. We are being very prudent in our use, water use during maintenance activities. Um, so realizing we need to flush to maintain water quality, we're just flushing just enough that we need to get the water quality there. And uh, one of the big things we've done in 2020 and 2021 is implemented COVID protocols. Um, even though that may not seem like it has much to do with water quality, we had to make sure that we had enough staff uh, in the event of an outbreak in the, um, in the water department to make sure we could maintain the water quality. Um, so we did um, things like staggered shifts. We arranged for emergency backups. I remember Councillor Wells actually came out uh, and early in the pandemic and uh, was actually trained as a backup sampler. Um, we did, and we got some regulatory relief from our, pro our, our the province as well. So that definitely helped in the last couple of years. And we're very, very happy to be hopefully exiting the need for those protocols. Uh, what we've achieved in for the ninth consecutive year, we have a hundred percent rating on our ministry inspection, which um, uh, uh, Ms. Banting had highlighted in the report. We re-accredited our drinking water quality management program with the, our accreditation body. We have a new bulk water station on Elm Street to service our bulk water haulers. We are in the midst of doing an infrastructure needs study um, for the distribution system, um, also the roof roads, wastewater, and stormwater systems as part of it. And I'm happy to announce that unbilled water, uh, the amount of water that we are not billing our customers has decreased from 47.3% in 2017 to 31.1% in 2021. That's a 16% reduction in the amount of unbilled water in four years. So I'm very, very proud of our staff uh, for accomplishing that. That's a very big accomplishment. And in the future, we are completing the Erie Street Water Main Replacement Project. That's ongoing right now. Um, I had also submitted for federal provincial funding to replace four water mains over the next four years. So fingers crossed that the, the feds in the province give us the money. Um, we are continuing our focus on reducing unbilled water. Staff are, again, doing the leak detection. They're, they're getting the, the, the breaks repaired as soon as they come up. Um, and one of the big things that council approved, approved in our 2021 budget um, it, to help our homeowners is a water service and sewer lot of replacement grant or loan program. So we're going to be rolling it out in the next month. We're just finalizing the paperwork for Treasury right now. So there's been a lot of great things happening, and I'm very proud of our staff and uh, what they've managed to accomplish and what we're going to do moving forward. Great, darling. We appreciate that. And that's a great number of, of reduction. It's something many of us that have been around for a while have been talking about and uh, you know, I think on behalf of council, big kudos to you guys. I think Harry said it right uh, after reading through the report on, on the great job that you guys do. And Harry, good job in getting that uh, certification. <laughs> With teachers uh, like our staff, it was very easy to do. <laughs> good stuff. Anything further, Councillor? Nothing for me. Thank you, Darlene. Uh, thank you to the rest of your staff. Um, keep up the good work. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kalamoto, anything to add? Uh, thank you through, uh, through you, to Mayor, uh, to uh, those watching at home. Just did want to point out uh, that uh, Manager Sutter and uh, Compliance Supervisor Manding and our Water Operations Supervisor, Mr. Kiesel, and our uh, new crew leader, um, all of them are uh, new to their positions and have doing have been doing such uh, a great job. And it's uh, sometimes uh, very difficult as the, the new person coming in, and again, me being here uh, less than a year and a half, uh, as a water and wastewater person for the past 20 years, again, just want to also echo uh, the, the councillor's praise uh, to staff here, coming together as, as a new team, taking on new things, being able to get this mark of 100% uh, just, just shows you the kind of team that uh, that the public have working for them in uh, in water, wastewater. And uh, I, I would put them up against any, any other team in the province. So thank you for that. Great. Thank you, Director Kalamoto. Uh, Councillor Cleff, did you have a question or was it answered? 
It wasn't a question. I just wanted to say it doesn't get much better than 100%. Congratulations. You guys did a great job. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks. Uh, thanks to the Water Department. It's uh, exactly uh, what we want to hear. Uh, no further questions, Council? Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Let's carry unanimously. Item 8.8 .8 is the Gateway CIP application 1338277 Ontario Inc. located at 72 Clally Street East. Recommendation that the Chief Administrative Office Report 2022-33 be received. The Council approved the Gateway CIP tax increment grant for 1338277 Ontario Inc. for the property located at 72 Clally Street East and the Economic Development Officer be directed to send notice of the approval to the Niagara Region. That the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute and grant, and grant agreement between uh, the City of Port Coburn and 1338277 Ontario Inc. subject to project completion approval from the Niagara Region and City of Port Coburn Economic Development Department and that a bylaw to enter into a grant agreement with 1338277 Ontario Inc. be brought forward at a future meeting of council. I have Councillors Bagu and Clayliff moving that. I'm going to go to Councillor Bagu. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, one thing here. Um, I've always been for openness and transparency, Mr. Mayor. And uh, since we're dealing with cities, city monies, which is ultimately our taxpayers' money, and uh, I've never been a fan of numbered companies. So I guess to Mr. Cotton, if, dry, if I drive by 72 Canali Street, where they applied for this grant, would I see the word Fontaines on the trucks? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bagu, that would be correct. This would be the Fontaine um, Transportation Expansion Program uh, at located at 72, um, uh, sorry, plans located at 72 Kalali. Councillor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all I need to know. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Councillor Clayliff? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Cotton, can I just ask you to give a bit of an overview to this, Mr. Cotton, as far as the general public, you know, understanding, it's hard to understand when you see these kinds of grants being given to companies. You know, I, I can read through the report and I understand how, you know, the tax dollars are coming back to us and everything else, but it's tough for, for citizens to read that and understand it and look at it. Could you just give a, a general overview of it and the explanation of how the money's come back and how it's going to benefit the city? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Cliff and all of Council and to those watching. Absolutely, the Gateway, uh, the Gateway CIP program was brought into effect about 10 years ago with the concept of encouraging um, development and uh, in the increase in jobs and smart growth, what, what the region defines as smart growth. So this is a joint program between the region and the city. Um, you have to meet certain criteria to qualify. You can qualify from as low as 40% in a tax increment grant up to, um, I believe it's 80%. 80 so this particular, uh, in the, this particular applicant has qualified for 65. So they had to score a certain number of points in order to get to that. They could have scored higher, they could have scored lower. Uh, but the idea is to, to move um, industrial land and get it developed. And uh, this, this particular applicant will be increasing the number of jobs. Ultimately, the tax assessment will go up, the, um, the impact value of the property will go up, uh, and ultimately the city of, um, of Port Coburn will see uh, an increase in, in taxes. Uh, we have also Mr. Louis wants to jump into this. Uh, thank you, through your worship to Councillor Kalealiff and the rest of Council. I appreciate uh, Mr. Cotton's explanation, and it makes sense. It's really the nuts and bolts of how the program works. But the principles behind the program, you know, these programs are Council approved. They exist for anyone who wants to apply, and they're really designed to get shovels in the ground on land that's vacant or otherwise, you know, primed for development. I know there was a newspaper article last year where a resident took exception to... Uh, to uh, the condominium development on, on West Street, you know, and, and I mean, some comments in that article were about 
the you know the company that was doing the development and so on. Those programs are available to anyone. There, we we want more and more people to come into City Hall. If anybody who's watching on YouTube would like a grant, please call me up and we'll get you uh, you know your property and your building permits in in here, and we'll we'll get you a grant. That grant money comes. It, it's not a loss of any tax dollars in any way. In fact, most of the uh, there is an increase in taxes to the property owner immediately uh, once MPAC gets the new construction on the roll. But there's a reduction in the amount of taxes based on full value that they would have paid. There's no check written from the city. We don't take taxpayer money from some taxpayers and give it to the owner of a property. We simply reduce some, not all, of their tax liability for the incremental construction. And then, after the five or ten year period, like the economic development officer described, they pay at full freight, which is usually a much higher amount for years into the future, for an, an, infinite, an infinite amount of time. So uh, I'd, I'd encourage any investors or, or private property owners to familiarize yourself with those programs. Give a call to Bram Cotton, Gary Long, myself, the mayor, and uh, we can get you into a CIP program that will help not just the owner of the property, but the whole community. Thank you. Uh, Councilor, anything further? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, perhaps Mr. Um, Bluey can answer this. Is there a reason why the region is reducing the taxes for five years and yet we reduce it for 10? Is it not usually the same or is there, why is there that difference in the tax reduction? Mr. Cotton? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Kalila. So this program is, depending geographically, is either a five-year or a 10-year program. Uh, as it mentions in the report, uh, a few months ago, Council for the City of Port Coburn approved an expansion of our gateway boundary, which would expand uh, it for 10 years from the city. We then applied to the region for them to match our 10 years in the expansion area. They have yet to um, approve that. It's still going through the approval processes. So at this point, this applicant is only eligible for, is eligible for 10 years from the city of St. Catharines and five years from the region. In the future, once it has gone through, not this applicant because they've applied in this time frame, but future applicants would be eligible for both the region and the city for 10 years. So it's, a, it's unfortunate for this, for this participant, but it's a matter of timing for them because we had done our application to the region. They are, um, uh, have not moved quickly on it uh, from their perspective to expand to the 10 years. Uh, I have complete faith that at some point they will uh, because that's the indication that we've been given, but at this point they haven't. So that's why it's 10 years for the city and five years for the region because it falls in the five year geography for the region and the 10 year geography for the, uh, for the city. Yeah, and my good friend, and Mayor, I, just a sec, my good friend Mayor Senzik would love to help us with this, but it is the city of Port Colburn, not the city of St. Catharines. Uh, and, and I'm sure you were thinking about the region because the region being up in the uh, St. Catharines area, even though it's technically Thorold. So uh, <laughs> just a little correction. Councillor, go Sorry, ahead. I had a little slip of the tongue. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Cotton, could I ask one more question? We had recently converted this land, some pieces of it back to, it had been a portion of it the residential, we, it went back to being industrial. A lot of the, there was some, uh, some amendments made to it, uh, to, to things that happened. Would it have been eligible for these kinds of grants if, if all of those other pieces hadn't fallen into place? Mr. Cotton? Uh, if it had not been zoned industrial, it would not be eligible for this, uh, for this grant, no. If it was being uh, built as residential, there are other grants that it would could have been eligible for, but this is an now that it's zoned industrial, this is an industrial grant. But even though at the time that we changed that, I thought that it, um, Fontaines were there at the time. So even that small portion that was that industrial area, and I think we expanded a little bit, did we not? Is that what, would it have been eligible without that expansion is what I was wondering. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to council, the portion that they are building on was residential. It was rezoned to industrial. Right. So this is a, a new building on that property where their current building is, is a separate, is, 
is a separate uh, piece of property and is, it was always zoned. My understanding is always properly zoned. So because we changed the zoning, this became eligible for this particular CIP program, yes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councilor Demaray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you um, to whoever on staff can, can hear this comment. I just, because our, our um, council program is being looked at more and more by by more residents as a result of being, having easier access, which is a good thing. Uh, but because of that, our reports need to have more information in them. Um, and I know that this is gonna, it's it's very cumbersome. I know for staff to, to do this, but to have things like mapping put into to these uh, reports are a good idea. Uh, with the CIP program, I've had people call me asking me, well, where are the boundaries of the CIP? Uh, so I'm trying to, uh, of that particular CIP anyway, so I'm trying to explain to them how, how things work, but um, if there were mappings available, uh, if there's a geographic limitation, then that should be put in the report so that people will be better understanding of that. And as far as the numbers, number, com uh, number companies go, I, um, I would agree with Councillor Baggio on that. It's, it's frustrating to see a number of company. I've had residents ask, ask me not to support anything with a number of companies. Uh, because they automatically think, think there's something going on. I tried to explain to them that that's it's common to, to deal with num numbered companies and that I wouldn't be willing to take that step. But um, I do understand the frustration and it, where, where possible, if you can insert the actual business we're talking about, that would be a better thing than just having the numbered company. Um, it just makes things easier for all um, and it's clearer for people to understand. But I just would ask for those, those couple of changes um, because somebody had said they felt that uh, the area on Kalali Street that we're dealing with right now was not part of that CIP area before. How did that happen? Um, and I was under the, the impression that the areas along the canal were part of it. So um, maybe somebody could speak to that about geographic areas. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor. And I'll, I'll just go to the clerk. So the clerk can work with staff with regards to that uh, uh, recommendation from Councillor Demery uh, moving forward as far as having that mapping. Absolutely, we'll do that going forward. Great, is that okay, Councillor? That'd be great. Good. And, and, and quite frankly, Ontario numbered companies are legal yeah. entities. So yeah. uh, the law states we have to deal with the legal entity, which is a number. Yes, I'm sure staff can put that uh, name in there. I, don't, I, I would hope that the business owner wouldn't object to it. My company is a numbered company. Don't even ask me what the number is because I don't use it. It's, it's CM <laughs> Steel. So I, I yeah. go by that. And, uh, but, you know, it, it is a legal name so I'm, I'm sure with uh, documents like this that we have to go by that legal name so um I, and, and i know what you're saying because you know we've seen things in the past happen and we 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 don't like it at times you're you're 100 you're percent correct counselor but um so if mr cotton and mr uh, long with your uh things moving forward just uh in brackets put the uh known name if there is one so uh counselor danch Uh, thanks for that. Um, just a couple points of interest. Um, numbered companies, I run two of them. And uh, you generally, uh, it's that number and operating as. So I, I don't think that's a, a big concern. I mean, it should be able to be uh, on the documentation as far as who you're dealing with. And uh, we all want to know who we're dealing with, right? Um, the second point was, and it's probably petty, eh? 72 Kalali Street. Kalali Street, what? East or west? So, and I know it's petty because I read the report. I actually did my homework. It doesn't state anywhere in there that it's east. So I think we should just tweak that form a little bit and uh, make sure that, that that's noted. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, that's why I read it with uh, Kalali Street East, Councillor. I noticed that it was gone. So uh, we'll make sure that the clerk reads that into the minutes that it is east. So those guys from St. Catharines trying to get used to the division in Port Colburn <laughs> for those roads that cross the canal. <laughs> Any further questions, Council? Seeing none, all in favor, put up your hand. And that's carried.
On the correspondence items, Councilor, or Council, Councilor, Council, uh, these items have been brought forward by Councilor Wells, so I will add a, a seconder to these. So item 9.1 is the letter from the uh, City of Thorold. Yeah, I just want to make sure because there was one for the town of uh, 40 re-included. So it's the support for increased fines for firearms infractions. I'm going to have Councillors Wells and Danch move that. Um, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a little bit of stats from Stats Canada. Firearm-related uh, violent crimes are on the rise in Canada. And in, based on their accounting, they have increased 81% since 2009. In addition to that, uh, violent offenses, including firearms, uh, increased in 2020 by 15%. Stiffer penalties is only one way of um, trying to reduce the illegal use of firearms, and it's a very worthy cause. So I, I would like to support um, uh, the town of Fort Erie and the city of Thorold. Uh, in that, I would like to move that the correspondence from the town of Fort Erie be received and that staff prepare a letter of support for the city of Thorold's request and forward it to the federal, provincial governments, AMO, FM, FCM, and the Niagara municipalities. Great. Thank you, Councillor. So, Councillor Dantz, you're okay with that, with, with supporting this? The only thing I have to say... In and, I, and I, I've been a part of this before when we've had some of these concerns. I'm a gun owner. I, I, a good gun owner is registered. So it's the bad guys that use the guns. It's not the good guys. So as much as I'm in support of protecting people and what they do, I don't think we need to pick on everybody that owns a gun because they're out there and for sport, they're a great thing. For the other things, they're not. Correct. And I believe what Councillor Wells is trying to do is, because this talks about the um, uh, consequences related to the importation, production, or distribution of firearms, firearms, firearms is the illegal side of things. We all know that if you're law-abiding with your firearm, uh, this wouldn't touch you, but it is the illegal portions of those. Correct, Councillor Wells? That is correct, and I too am a firearms owner and uh, have dealt with this too. But this is specifically directed to at infractions that the good guys like Frank and I don't, don't, don't do. participate in um, doing. Great. Okay, Councillor Ranch. Good. Perfect. Any other, other questions? So this is to support Thorold. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? That's carried. Item 9.3 is a recommendation from the uh, Township of Waynefleet regarding settlement area boundary review. I'm going to have Councillors Wells and Kaleloff move this. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Worship. Um, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture claimed that Ontario is losing agricultural land to urban development at a rate of about 175 acres per day. And, th and this is totally unsustainable uh, if we intend to grow um, the population. Uh, loss of agricultural land will directly affect the production of crops and hence the food supply. Um, Niagara Region in their regional office uh, official plan review have identified the, the most appropriate and feasible locations to accommodate future growth for two up till 2051. Uh, within the Niagara region. Some of these locations, such as those in Waynefleet, are prime agricultural lands. So I ask you, what good is growth at a cost of being unable to provide food for that growth? So I would like to move that the correspondence from the Township of Waynefleet be received and that staff prepare a letter of support for the Township of Waynefleet's request and forward it to the provincial government, regional of Niagara, and Niagara area municipalities. Great, Councillor Clayle, if you're fine with uh, supporting that. Great, thank you. So it is moved and seconded. Any further questions? Okay, um, Councillor Wells has a point here and I know what uh, Mayor Gibson uh, 
is is speaking about from his council on this. Um, and we do have Mr. Schultz here this evening if there are any questions to him, but we have the three areas in in our Ward 4 area, so our, our rural zone, which are, are Bethel, Shirkston, and, and, and uh, Gasline. Uh, there aren't any changes to Port Colburn um, with regards to that because they are in our farming community. But Wayne Fleet makes a huge point here, and we brought this up a number of years ago when the former provincial government just swathed Port Colburn in green as opposed to looking at lands. So now they've taken out lands that are actually ungrowable, and, and, and I've sat in this chamber through committees of adjustment where we've had farmers show up to support somebody that wants to build on a portion of their farm because you couldn't grow weeds on it, yet it has to get turned down because of the swath of green the uh, province put here 15 or 20 years ago. And, you know, we, we really want upper tier levels of the government to come down and say, look, we don't mind growth, but it has to be in the right areas. We don't, and, and as Councillor Wells uh, properly says, we don't want to put it on beautiful, pristine farm growing land, which, you know, we do have, uh, maybe not as much as Wainfleet, but we do have good growing areas here. But we also have bad areas, just like Wainfleet, where that's where the growth should go. So we would hope that they do listen to us on this because, you know, to tell us we can't build on something that is ungrowable is, is kind of asinine to me. But, you know, we've had to turn those down in the past. I mean, that, that is tax dollars to Port Colburn if we're putting houses or, or other types of buildings on there. So uh, I would hope that upper tier levels of government, particularly the province, listens to us because we're the boots on the ground here. Uh, quite frankly, most people from Toronto don't come down here uh, from the province, from the ministries to actually look at anything. So... Uh, we do invite them from time to time, but uh, we hope that they do take us up on our uh, on our invites uh, now that uh, COVID is subsiding. So uh, I'm I'm fully in support of this, uh, and I just want to know uh, no further questions. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillor. And the last item is item 9.10. Uh, so Councillor Wells had, had contacted me with regards to this, so I'll put this on the floor that it's going to be a motion to refer this to the Environmental Advisory Committee, moved by Councillor Wells and Councillor Demeray. There is no discussion on that, um, but I don't, you know, I don't think there will be much uh, with regards to this that we send this letter to that uh, committee to look at. Councillor Wells, anything to add? Sorry, I had a little difficulty there. No, <laughs> I, I don't have anything else to add. It, it's just, um, you know, we in 2017 did uh, uh, take the status of being a, a non willing host. And I think it's important that uh, we refer this to the Environmental uh, Advisory Committee to get their take on it and keep us up to date as to what uh, changes might be uh, coming down the road. Great. Thank you, Councillor. So it is a motion to refer to that committee for it to come back. Uh, to the closest meeting after the committee has dealt with it with a recommendation or anything that comes out of that meeting. Uh, so there really is no date set yet, if that's fine with council. Uh, there is no debate on this. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried unanimously. Again, thank you, Councillor. Okay, that is it with the items there. There are no motions this evening. Does any councillor have a notice of motion? Okay, seeing none. Minutes of boards and committees. I'm going to have councillors Bodner and Wells move these in block. The Port Coburn Public Library Board minutes of February 2nd, 2022, and the Environmental Advisory Committee minutes December 8th, 21. Questions on either of those minutes? All in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. Bylaws, we have bylaws 20.1, 20.2, 20.3, 20.4, 20 20.5, and I'll have councillors Kaleloff and Bagu move those. Are there any questions on any of the bylaws? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. There are no confidential items this evening or procedural motions and no information items. Ladies and gentlemen, that ends our council meeting. I'm going to adjourn this meeting at this time. We thank you for watching. Council, great job tonight. Staff, fantastic. Great news coming out of, uh, out of all departments. And uh, we're uh, 
moving along at light speed here in the city of Port Colborne. Again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you at our next meeting.